Uh, yes, it is really that funny. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Hello, the Hello. live stream. Save life, I see that you're on. And I am so happy to have you. It's been a pretty busy week. And we uh, just want to let you know that it's really awesome if you could like this show on Facebook or on YouTube that lets yeah. other people like yourselves know all about this and introduce it to them. And also, if you know anyone that would like to have Friday night chats with us, uh, feel free to share this post. And yeah. yeah, and it'll be a lot of fun. We always have a lot of fun with this. And of course, Hello to mom and dad, yeah. my best first subscribers. <laughs> and you can, so we, we're making some tech changes Ooh. like we are every single week. And uh, I now have a laptop for Karen here so she can type oh, and say Thank hello you. to the people. Yes, you can turn it. Second tech, tech change is that my new Canon camera up here yeah. is doing a live stream. That's something that I did for Justin when I was in North Carolina last week. I got his Canon camera working on live. Had a glitch the first attempt, but hoping for better this weekend for his Rooted premiere. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I got it working for us, so that's cool too. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so again, uh, I'm Randy. This is Karen. We're the Kleinmans. We're from Minnesota. Yeah. And we do this on Friday nights. Uh, it's associated with a new website I created called The Daily Grower, dailygrower.com. And we just started doing it, and it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we kept on doing it. And so we are are just love, love having you guys here and love having new folks uh, as well. So uh, God made me whole from Arkansas. Yeah. Great to Welcome. have you. So you type in there right here. What, but they and, can hear me. Oh, I know, but everyone wants to like be acknowledged in the chat too, right? So we're, we're, we're working on. Do you? Okay, but here's. I the can't thing. type in it. <laughs> but it says I'm you, and then. Well, that's my channel. That's right. I know. So we'll see. either way, all right. So if I feel like I need to. Type <laughs> the first thing we always do as people are getting on is have our obligatory weather chat because we're from Minnesota, and. All conversations uh, start with the weather. Start with the weather. So yeah. this week has been terrible. It's been cold. We had yesterday was a beautiful. Yesterday day. was awesome, and it went back yeah. to terrible today. <laughs> so put something in the chat there about where the weather is, so that we can either yeah uh, say oh my gosh that's terrible or uh, really just uh, you know sinfully have envy uh, yeah. at your weather. So mostly that's partial, mostly what happened. <laughs> partial sin on that envy for me was going to North Carolina last week yeah. and hanging out with Justin Rhodes. Cause it was like 75 and sunny and the air is clear. It's quiet. And there's you could stop talking about birds it. Cause singing, you didn't take me with you. Wild turkeys <laughs> up in the hills during Turkey season, gobbling all day long. It Wonderful. was great. So, um, yeah, so that's that was awesome. And we came back to Minnesota. It was nice for a little bit for me to go hunting, turkey hunting. And then it came back from that. And it was just nasty all week <laughs> since I've been back. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, all right. So if you're new here, thanks for letting us know uh, how it's doing. It sounds like it's snow flurries in Baudette, Minnesota. That is way, way up north. Uh, from this savory life, 55 and raining in Arkansas, and just about, you know, I don't think it got much above 50 today, and it rained a little bit, yeah. and uh, yeah, it's it's just can't wait for for better weather. We I got out and we were able to do some fun things. I got some garden stuff started last last weekend, and. Uh, and it was nice for that. And then everything just kind of went south <laughs> afterwards. Well, we had some really nice weather in March that kind of, I think, spoiled us. Yeah. That's As true. Minnesotans, like, if we want to keep up what we're used to, then it should be pretty cold and wet and miserable 
clear through like middle of May at least. <laughs> so if we get a warm up, then we're then we get all kind of excited, and then we don't know how to adjust back to the norm. Yeah. So. All right. So again, if you're new this this time around, what we like to do is have our weather chat as people are coming on. Then we then we do what's called the win of the week, where Karen and I share one and possibly more sometimes. I'm not gonna lie. Things that we did this week that furthered us in our goals or just yeah. something positive to share about usually having to do with the farm, sometimes farm, sometimes not. Yeah, uh, sometimes they're personal goals. Yep. Yeah. And then after that, we basically look at what was the most popular story on Daily Grower this week. And we have a new feature this week. Uh, viewer questions, <laughs> leave a voicemail. I like surprises. And uh, so oh yes, surprises that's me. another fixture <laughs> of our live stream as I am always surprising Karen with things and yeah. uh, letting her know exactly nothing about what my plans are other than the first topic or the, the, the discussion topic. Sometimes. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. But this week, Karen came up with the discussion topic and that we're talking about side hustles. Yeah. We're talking about how to fund your homestead or your homestead dream or your farm. Uh, if you want to start a farm, I don't know. For, for all intents and purposes, I consider a homestead and a farm very similar. One just sells to other people with like an intention of a business. Yeah. Homesteaders, I would say, you know, we can sell to other people, but they aren't necessarily trying to make it a profitable thing right. or, you know, they're not filling out tax forms. How about that? No. Um, Cassie Davis, North Texas, 70 degrees and storming. I heard there was going to be hail. Ooh. Uh, maybe we had in about a hail Texas. a couple weeks ago That's that true. was pretty crazy. We did have about a hail. Yeah. So, anyway, I always let Karen go first on the win of the week. My win of the week. Okay, so I was thinking about it. And one that would be semi-farm oriented, even though it's maybe not my own personal win because I'm not like the chicken guru here, but Maddie isn't going to be participating tonight. So I'm going to, she had a very good, uh, hatch rate, um, on two different, uh, batches of chicks that she hatched this week. Yep. So that was very exciting. She hatched some Bielfelders, which are a standard size, uh, German breed, they lay like really nice big brown eggs and um, and then some Milfleur de Clays, which are little bantam ones. They're basically pets, although their eggs are tasty too. You just have to eat more of them. Yeah, just so three to one. Yeah, that would be a win. And then the other win is I'm working on goals. And Randy can't, can't he said I had to show because he thinks it's hysterical. <laughs> So I got this water bottle. <laughs> it's as big it as has motivational. Head. It metrics. does. You didn't see that? <laughs> no. Almost finished. Show, yeah, that, show that to the camera. Good Let morning. See it. I don't know if anybody can see it. Good morning. Hydrate yourself all the way down to you did it. So <laughs> almost finished. Yeah. You know what it should say instead? Like <laughs> bathroom trip number one. <laughs> Bathroom trip number two. <laughs> I am, I have been for my lifetime, like not a good, just fluid drinker of any, I don't drink much. So I'm trying to I, aim clean. on the other hand, fill myself with as much bubbly water as possible. <laughs> that does not hydrate you the same as I know. flat water though. I know, I know. Um, Anyways, so I'm increasing my water intake and I actually, this is actually the second water bottle I've purchased since I started working on this. The first one was a one, but it was smaller. And what I really was like, see how much water I was drinking. So it, I like would lose track of whether I was Filling it or not. Now, what's this doodad here on the front? What well, does that do? Uh, that is that a button? It. No, yeah, because see, it closes oh, down. You got to show it up here for people to see it. Closes down, and then you can lock it closed, or you can unlock it. And like, ain't nobody going to drink my... Pop it up. My... So, how yeah. much is it? Half a six, gallon? Six, it's a half gallon. <laughs> <laughs> so my goal is to drink at least one, maybe one and a half of these every day. <laughs> one and a half of them? Oh, well, yeah. I, I will say this for all the laughing at the, um, yeah. what, I mean, 
worksite cooler or <laughs> whatever this thing is. <laughs> this is for a whole reconstruction crew. You cannot get paper cups and use my <laughs> water bottle. It is working rather nice. Uh, you know, yeah. you have used it as part of a like diet and weight loss goal. And yeah. It seems to yep. be seems to be working. So kudos. Beneficial. Su kudos Thank to you. you laugh, well. laugh at my win all you want. <laughs> I'm going to have my pool body ready in no time. That's right. That's yeah. Right. Okay. So my turn. Oh, let's see here. Some folks already put their win. Savory Life found out today there's some money available for infrastructure. Yeah. You've talked about that a few times. Some farm infrastructure ready to go. And then three turkey tags filled is my win. Oh, that must be your dad. Uh, that is my dad. Yeah. So, uh, well, that kind of steals a little bit of my thunder because one of my wins would be. Oh, you have pictures for your wins pictures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. all. I am all prepared. This was uh, hunting turkey hunting. That is actually my turkey that Jack is holding up. But Jack did. My ten year old son did shoot his first uh turkey ever on his first shot on his first shot the, yeah the boy's a natural i mean yeah i don't know where he got that Comes because i injury. am not a good thing but i do <laughs> i have missed two turkeys uh and yeah so anyway that is that's one of my wins and you know while i was doing this i found a couple other a couple other shots that i thought were pretty pretty cool this would be last year maddie's nice second turkey uh and i got all of these from google photos and they're like what happened this week one year ago two years ago this is one year ago i believe four years ago was this that's turkey hunting after my dad and i were done turkey hunting and uh the neighbor's tractor starting on fire and my Thanks. dad basically a boy scout i don't know i don't think he was ever in boy scouts <laughs> the only person who keeps uh, a jacket for all weather in his car at all times, as well as apparently a fire extinguisher, which is what you can see in his hand there. Uh, and then last year, two no. years, two years ago, this is our first yeah. brood of great Pyrenees puppies. Yeah. Not they were a staged so photo. Cute. Not a staged no. photo at all. I think they were just hungry. <laughs> and then yeah, this so one cute. was. I believe three years ago. Mm, no. The the compost pile no. isn't as tall now as that it was. That was two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Three years ago we didn't have that many lambs. Hey. Hey, Country Living Homestead. Welcome. Luke, welcome, buddy. Hello, hello. Uh and uh yeah. Oh, oh, here we go. This one was from four years ago. This is my front pasture. Normally there'd be a fence in front of that tree and the tree would also be standing upright. But this is someone who was uh, under the influence of multiple <laughs> substances and yeah. ran through our through our front yard, through the fence, through 92 feet of fence. And this is a 20 foot tall Colorado spruce that they just clipped off. They were Crazy. inches away from getting impaled by a two by six that was that was my fence. That was four years ago. You can see yeah. the streaks through the through the pasture there. So crazy. This is after the car got towed out of there and everything. So that was uh, not part of my wins of the week, but also I just found a bunch of pictures from from what's it's, our 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 life. It's an eventful week of the year, I guess. This week, yeah. yeah. So other wins of the week. I made it to 3,000 subs on YouTube. Hey, Thank you so much. Go. Lots of people on here made yeah. that happen. And that is kind of the Justin Rhodes effect. You get uh, put on his YouTube channel and people follow you. So 100 subs, 700 of them are due to Justin Rhodes. I don't know about that. The rest of them are all just accounts that my mom has made. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Karen's, uh, Karen's win was... Um, I already gave my win. The broilers, right? No. No, the you're... The chicks hatching. The chicks hatching, that's yeah. right. Okay, so we also have 200 broilers on the farm yeah. now, and... I should have counted that cause, as part of my win, because I helped get all of those... Like in the right. She handled all that while I am 
while I was in uh, North Carolina. Yeah. Having living, fun with my friends. Living the dream. <laughs> Jack got his first turkey. Yeah. Um, yeah, I made it. was it, a big week. Yeah, I made it back from North Carolina. I, I had a behind the scenes video that I created while I was down in North Carolina. It's very good. And it's got 600 views. And Justin just thought it was amazing. I sent him a text and I said, hey, I made this video. Will you look at it? Make sure I don't put any spoilers in it or, you know, anything, you know, every once in a while, if you're at someone's house uh, and, you know, you film stuff, you, I always feel like it's necessary to ask them, is there anything that I caught that you don't want? There wasn't anything this time. Uh, I went to the Hollers too, Holler Homestead, and asked them the same thing. You know, sometimes you got a secret that's going to be a new video that they're working on. And yeah. if, like, you show it, you just totally, you know, uh, spoiler alerted something you know for their Luke? channel. Luke Fleener? Yeah. Uh, I talked to him a couple of days ago. Oh. Do you know him? Well, I think I went to school with his sister. He grew up in Maple Grove, so... Oh! Oh, uh, I think I do know Luke. Well, we'll talk about Luke in a little bit. Yeah. He, he's, he's part of the agenda Oh, tonight. okay. Uh, well, hey, Luke. Week would be a voicemail feature all set on the Daily Grower website this week, which uh, I was not sure exactly how uh, long it was going to take me to do that. In the end, it took me about 25 minutes, so that was pretty cool. Um, all right, let's check out. Yeah, we've got some new new folks comments. on here talking. Priscilla Brooks, brand new subscriber. Great job and nice to know you. Priscilla, where are you from? Let us know. Yeah. Type it in the chat. We'd if you got a win of the week, yeah. let us know what it is. And uh, Country Living, retired from the Homestead. Homes, retired from the Air Force, now just starting Homestead. So excited. It is super exciting to move to a property and get started. You see people on YouTube. You live vicariously through them for so long. And then all of a sudden, those first set of chickens come or whatever. And, uh, you know, that's usually where people start. It's uh, pretty cool. Kingsburg, California. Priscilla, welcome uh and country living homestead is here congrats on the subscribers thank you so much god made me whole saw you on justin Rhodes from arkansas and luke is from zimmerman Very apparently close. he's from maple grove and i that's where we grew up maple yeah grove. his sister and i were good friends in high school yeah yeah so i haven't talked to her in a long time though. those those are our wins of the week and yeah is it well, the microphone is like in the way oh, of I this see. and not all of those are showing up over here. Yep. So these ones, sorry, folks, it's a tech timeout. <laughs> these ones are Facebook oh. and these ones are YouTube. Okay. And this one comes in a little bit later. Than oh, that okay. So we're oh, there we go. There's lots of technology happening here. Somebody said that they were on time for the school bus all week long. I would say that's a major win. Doggone. I mean, being on time for anything all week long is like. <laughs> I would high five you for True. sure. True. Yeah. Sue Hartwigson coming over after seeing you on Justin's channel. Thank you so much for showing up. We do this every Friday, as many Fridays as we can. Last week, you know, sometimes things just take precedence, believe it or not. Last week it was turkey hunting. <laughs> yeah. And Karen's not to the point yet. I haven't trained her in on the tech. On all stuff. the tech to get this no. done. But I would love to do that so she can run it when I'm if not. If you had it set up like and just where I could just like turn Flick it on, up. I could do it on my own. That's true. The people would love it. Just all Karen <laughs> all the time. Laurel B saw you on Justin Rhodes channel from East Central Illinois. Where in East Central Illinois? Oh. We yeah. are from well, not from. Six or seven years of our lives were yes. in East Central we, Illinois. It's where our first two daughters were born. Our marriage, our marriage like blossom, blossom began flourished. in in Champaign Urbana. This is uh, moving the camera. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, and in case you just showed up, you might have to. <laughs> my wife is drinking <laughs> a lot of water. It's good for you. Yeah, Country Living says Homestead says our win of the week. Is our chickens uh, now going to be cooped on their Island. own before their door shuts? So nice not to have to chase them around in the dark. That is fantastic. Getting that, uh, you know, do you have one of those automatic doors? Ooh. Those are pretty cool. Yeah. I bet Matt, I bet that's on Maddie's want list. Yeah. 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 You know, what's really funny is that we had mm -hmm. Karen's brother farm sit 
for us when we went on vacation once. And the big funny thing after that was is that they tried their darndest to chase all the chickens back into the coop at night. And they, then, well, not at night. Well, they didn't realize that if they just waited like probably another half hour, the chickens would have gone in on their own. Yeah. They were trying to like get the chickens in because it was getting dark, not realizing that our chickens had already been trained to do that. And so the next night, they just kind of about it or they. No, they messaged us. And they were like, oh, it was a lot of those chickens in. And we were like, let's wait a little bit. They'll go in on their own. <laughs> Laurel B, you grew up in. Oakwood, like Middle Fork, and in Kiki or not Kikiki, Kickapoo, the state park. Ooh! I hunted at Middle Fork and fished at Middle Fork all the time. That's the exit you that you that took. That area, yeah, was the Oakwood exit. Uh, Salt Fork and Middle Fork are where I oh, grew up. Says yes. Loving where I learned to love smallmouth bass, and one of the reasons why we moved where we move where we live now, which is right across. Uh, really close to the Rum River yeah. where I can catch smallmouth bass. So sure. um, it's great. Oh, Laurel, don't say that. <laughs> Still great fishing. Now oh, I'm going to have to like come up with an excuse to go down there <laughs> and and fish a little. Well, when's the next time we're going to go see Dulcie? Dulcie would have us any time. That's true. Yeah. That's right. All right. Well, thank you, Laurel, for showing up. That's a really cool connection. Love yeah. that we know That's exactly exciting. where you're from. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Sue said she's from Central Iowa. We're at in Central Iowa. We we, we got our sheep from Central Iowa. Did we Was not? it Central? It started with an E. The name of the town, didn't it? Uh, Ever 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 something like that. Eldridge. Eldridge. No. no, that's not. I feel like there's an E and an R. Laurel B says we can fish together. I'll bring I'll bring my kids. They've never fished. Yeah. Wading in the river. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it'll be awesome. All right. So next um, on the on the list is talking about this week's top feature on the Daily Grower. If you guys don't know, this is the Daily Grower, just dailygrower.com. It's a website I put together. It's a curation site. So we have one story every day that is for you if you are wanting to grow anything grow your own food grow your freedom grow your homestead grow your farm grow your finances your financial freedom yeah. for sure so one one story a day sign up up here top right subscribe and uh you can get one of these in your email a day or you can get one email a week that just sends them all yeah. to you in your email it's super easy and then i'm starting to work on a bunch of stuff for subscribers uh, that uh, is just free stuff that I find. So uh, and free stuff and that I that I create that as you, well. That you pull from elsewhere. You're not writing all right. This. These yeah. articles are just stuff that I find that I think yeah. would be super useful. You'll notice in the top left corner, there's also contribute. So if you find something, feel free to send it to me. I would love to have it for sure. But what we do here is we don't go over all five articles. We just go over the article that was clicked on the most by our current subscribers. And that, drum roll please, is Tuesday's article. Thank you for the drum roll, honey. <laughs> Appreciate the support. I was trying to find the name of the town where we got our sheep. <laughs> okay, that's fine. All right, so while she does that, I will talk about Tuesday's, which was tomato tips and tricks. I I'm never cease to amaze at tomatoes and their popularity in the garden. Seems to be like what everybody wants uh, to make sure that they have plenty of. And we are no different. In fact, I think maybe half of our garden seems to be completely devoted to tomatoes. Not necessarily by I what we plant, tomato. but in general. I love garden tomatoes. They, they I take over half of the garden. It's like sure. one of those things that store tomatoes are just not good. And so... I, I look forward to garden tomatoes all summer so that I can eat them and make and can salsa and stuff out of them so that I can never buy tomatoes at the store. So the most popular article this week was this article from upfrontandbeautiful.com all about tomatoes. And I really liked it because it's just a whole page, just all about everything from seed to Seeding to eating is basically where it comes down to. And they had a couple of, well, one specific interest that I, uh, interesting 
piece that I have here that I thought was really cool. I never thought of, which is lacto fermenting green tomatoes. So you see, they oh. have they have cherry tomatoes that are still green, and then they did a lacto ferment of those, you know, with some peppers. Looks like there's some mustard seeds or something in there, uh, and I really want to try that. Some garlic in there, some hot oh. peppers. Uh, maybe not so many hot peppers for the rest of the family, but me and Jack, we can do we can do hot peppers. Yeah, um, you guys so like, like the hot. That peppers. originally is what brought me into this to this article, but then as I finished reading it, you know, there was just obviously caprese salad. I mean, well, that's one of the reasons we even have a garden. Is caprese it is. salad. Um, but, I buy a whole lot of mozzarella. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of good information in this article. If you want to go to Daily Grower, just click on on it and it will be there for you. The other thing, if you're new and don't know about this, is that this page changes every Monday morning and starts over with Monday's article and builds up. If you ever want to go back and see a previous article, there's the archives uh, down here or down at under get involved. There's the content archive and that shows you all of the previous articles. And uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I do put stuff in there that might challenge your, uh, challenge your orthodoxy. All right. So I put an article in there that was written that said, that said something about maybe compost tea isn't the, you know, wonder drug for your garden that we all have been led to believe. Got a couple of angry unsubscribes on that one, but still <laughs> worth reading. I still think that even if you're going to use compost tea, it's worth reading uh, yeah. an, a, an alternate viewpoint. Let's say that. Do you use compost tea? I don't use compost tea. In fact, one of the major reasons that article was kind of not pro compost tea was because it's incredibly difficult to do it right. Hmm. And it's, even more difficult to know if you're doing it right. Uh, because you got to have like scientific equipment. You got to have like yeah. a, a microscope there you go. to be able to know uh, if you did it right. So um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that was the reason for that. And some people just couldn't handle that. That's okay. It's okay. I, but I'm still really want this site to be informative and I want it to be a way- You're not trying to be super controversial. No, I'm not trying to be super controversial. <laughs> I want you're, it to be informative, but I want for, it like, to be more than just be arguing. An, an echo chamber of the same yeah. things you see. I want something that'll be worth your time. That's one of the reasons I created this site is yeah. because there's so much article, so much stuff out there. I wanted people to be able to get the best of the best in a timely fashion that didn't overwhelm them even more if they're yeah. already overwhelmed. So yeah, that's super great. That's uh, that's what Daily Grower is about. Would love to have you uh, subscribe. Just go to dailygrower.com slash subscribe and feel free to contribute as well because the more we all contribute, yeah. the better it gets because I don't know everything on the internet, believe it or not. I know my kids, nope, my kids don't think that. They're teenagers. <laughs> they know better now, don't yeah. they? Edgewood, <clears throat> Iowa. Edgewood. Yep. Are you anywhere near Edgewood, Sue? She said 22 miles west of Des Moines, so she would not be because Edgewood was south east Iowa, I believe. So I don't feel like we went that far into Iowa. Maybe, maybe I'm it's, just totally maybe it's northeast. Crazy. Iowa. It's not that big of a state. Well, I, don't I mean, we had to drive through more of Minnesota to get to Iowa than Iowa is. Now I have to look south. it up on the map because I, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> okay, so uh, Laurel, there you go. If you're just looking at fermentation, I suggest start with sauerkraut if you like sauerkraut. It's the simplest, easiest way to do a lacto ferment. And it's probably something that you've eaten before. Hopefully it's something that you like. I love it. So I grow cabbage almost exclusively for sauerkraut. And thank you to my lovely mother who bought me a crock. Finally. She's wonderful. And you wanted, not finally, she finally got me, but I finally no, got one. But you've been asked, you'd wanted me to make you one. And I've just have never gotten. Well, going. yeah, I, I wanted know. that. But I also, someday, I found two or three of them. I found two or three of them at an estate sale. And like these old ladies just bid them up. Like I couldn't buy one. And it was an estate auction, right? And these, just like these three old ladies are like, nope, those are ours, buddy. And they're just like, 
ten dollars and i was like, okay 20 bucks you know boom 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 so i just i they yeah they had plenty of money that i wasn't this willing to spend on. northeast of des moines okay so i was wrong it's northeast not not southeast yeah. yeah all right okay so we're gonna try something here something we've never done before which is we have a short video to introduce the next section and this video was created by our son jack he has oh. his own he has his own youtube channel hey farmer brad thanks for showing up hello, hello. um and i think he, i'm not sure how long he worked on it but he's like dad do you like it i said i love it so we're gonna try it and see what we think all right so you so this is our new segment it's called viewer questions and here we go <laughs> It was six, six, right. six seconds of like intro Sweet. transition bumper. I'm going to get him oh. to do a little bit longer one. Yeah, he's working on it. But I mean, that was pretty cool. Very cool. I thought. So anyway, viewer questions. Okay. Viewer questions is the new feature on Daily Grower. If you go to dailygrower.com slash uh, voicemail, you can just hit this big orange button that says start recording and record 90 seconds of any question that you want to ask. Cool. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and I think that. And then are, will we be airing them and, and answering the questions on, on the live show? Yeah, we will. So we're going to do that. And we have our first one this week that. And Luke, who's currently on, is actually watching the show. So that's pretty cool that we have our first question. So I'm going to also cue that up um, and okay. we'll hope that it works as well. Here we go. Hey, Randy, this is Luke from Zimmerman, Minnesota. My family and I are introducing chickens to our place for the first time. And my question for you is one can you keep layers in a chicken tractor 24 7 um full time and two about how many layers um laying hens can a siskovich tractor comfortably hold looking forward to your answer take care thank you all right cool can people hear that did you did you hear luke's question that's what i want to know Put it, type it in the chat there. If he didn't, we're it was, always we're it was, always working out the technicality. If you didn't, it was just thirty seconds of us standing here and Karen talking to Maddie with some question. So uh, Brad said it was no audio, but it was just his headphones apparently. Oh, so if if you if you heard that, let me know because I would really be interested to see if it if it worked. So uh, oh, scroll down. Somebody said they. Yes, yes loud, loud and clear. And clear. All right. Great. So, Yay. Okay. So back to Luke. Luke actually asked me that question on my Daily Grower Facebook page. And I said, hey, Luke, you know, it'd be super cool if you could test out my new feature. <laughs> so totally was cool about that. Apparently, Karen knows Luke. Well, you told me about that you had been talking to somebody and that you were trying this new feature out and everything and all about it, but you didn't mention like first and last name. So I honestly, I didn't, I didn't make any connection. I didn't look up, but or I didn't remember his last name. So, oh, um, yeah. Anyway, no, as soon as I saw his name, I was like, I know him. Yeah. I so I guess he just moved to Zimmerman oh, and cool. has pasture and is just getting started with, I normally wouldn't have all this backstory from just, you know, the voicemail that he left. But yeah. Since I was chatting with him before and made him, uh, do that voicemail. Um, so anyway, he's got some new pasture and wants to know, can you put uh, laying hens in a chicken tractor full time? Yes. And the answer is absolutely. Go for absolutely. it. Absolutely. It's better that they're on the pasture. It is. Getting your pasture fertilized and making it so you don't have to clean the coop out. It's just, I love it. I love things that are dual purpose. So a chicken tractor is dual purpose because it, it sends chickens off to do their duty of fertilizing and it means you don't have to clean a coop which is the best we, part we get our layers out of the coop and into a tractor as soon as we can which is going to happen tomorrow 
great. We could have probably yeah. gone sooner, but maybe it's a good thing that we didn't. And we often run a, a premier fence around with them too, so that they can even during the day, they can get out of the tractor and range around, but you don't have to do that. That's true. So we I, keep, cause we keep more in there than what would probably be super comfortable if you were keeping them in there all day. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, my advice to Luke was if you don't have a a Premier One fence or something that you can put around it, you don't have you know a charger or you know, don't put a fence up if you don't have a electric uh, uh, fence or energizer for it because then the chickens just learn that it, you know the and and more importantly the predators learn that it doesn't shock you yeah. when they touch it yeah. Um, and I, my advice would be is that if you just have them in the chicken tractor and the chick chicken tractor is kind of full, just move it more often. Yeah. Um, and do just keep them moving. You know, they don't want to be sitting in a, in a dirty diaper like anybody. You know? <laughs> no. So, um, plus it gives them, you know, you'll find what works probably after one season of how long that they can be in one spot where they do enough digging and they do enough fertilizing to actually make it worth a while. Yeah. If your soil in Zimmerman is like ours here, it's totally sand and and they will fertilize a spot and it will be green the next year and by the next fall it will look like it they never had chickens on it before. So uh the qu second you gotta question keep, you got to keep running them. Yeah. You year definitely got year after year if you want to see the benefit continue. Yeah. And on yeah. 20 acres you could probably have thousands of chickens on that land before it really not that any of had, us really want that. Yeah. Before it <laughs> really lot. did any like, you know, damage in sure, terms of sure. over fertilization. Yeah. Yeah. Your neighbors might not like it and you might not like chickens anymore. But if you if you had 20 chickens in a Sosovitz chicken tractor on 20 acres, you're not even making a dent right. in that pasture. Especially However, you should be often. forewarned if you were to move them through like an area that's more like your yard as opposed to a pasture because what we've found especially with our layers not so much the broilers is that they will dig like little divots to um dust, dust bathe, bathe. Yep. and then you know you could like break an ankle <laughs> <laughs> out there so we're uh we've been working on a system to get the uh chicken manager to fill in the divots. Yes. But so, we'll see. Uh, Maddie, Maddie, our daughter, <laughs> she's 16. She's our poultry manager. Yeah. I hired her this yeah. year. Uh, and one of the things that she neglected to do last year before she was on payroll was fill all those divots. And so $100, she, $150 of lawnmower uh, maintenance fees uh, after that means yeah. we'll, we'll change that. So how many layers could you put in a Siskovich chicken tractor? So... I have always pushed the limits for meat birds with Siskovich chicken tractors. I think his book says like 40 and uh, uh, I have done up to 45 and I've done up to 50 when I started and lost a couple on pasture and gotten down to, I think 46 is the number of broilers that I've had in there. Now layers are going to get, unless you have bantams, they're going to get bigger, right? So you don't want to go as many. And they also flap and fly around and they roost. And so you have to think about how much room that you have. And then you also have to think about your, uh, your, you know, your nesting boxes. Like, do you have enough nesting boxes for that many birds? So yeah. we have put our layers on pasture. And uh, as I told you, Luke, before, I'll tell everyone else, 25 was probably the max, maybe 30. If We had a mixed flock, some bantam chicks, some bantam chickens as well as some full, full size birds. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, that's, that was what was comfortable for us. Brad, farmer Brad said one and a half to two birds per square foot. So a Siskovich chicken tractor is about 70 square feet. So that's 35 ish, 30 to 35. You're getting in that two, yeah. two birds per square foot. I liked when we didn't have them, when we have them in a, in a premier one fence where they can where they can free range or day range. Yeah. Um, I I packed in as many as I could in there during the day because they didn't really spend much time in there during the day. Yeah, I think the... It was basically like their sleeping quarters, you know. Right. And um, then the hardest thing is just making sure you have an, 
enough like roosting space for however yep. many you have. Yeah. So for roosting space, you're going to need like, you know, a good eight to 12 inches per bird. And that is, that was really kind of the limiting factor for us because yeah. you could fit a bunch in there, but you still have to get in the tractor to do your feeder and your water. And then it's kind of like jumping hurdles to get over. We just use closet rods. Um, do you have a picture of our... I do have a Siskovich Lane chicken track. tractor eggmobile conversion on our YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Um, it's my fifth highest views. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> if you look at YouTube's like analytics, my channel views are almost solely due to Siskovich chicken tractor videos. So, People want to see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I did one where I did a build, or no, I didn't build it. I showed all the things that I did that were tips and tricks while building it and some modifications I made. And that one has like over 50,000 views. So uh, that's my meat and potatoes for the, for my YouTube channel. So Luke, I hope that answers your question. Uh, I wouldn't go much more in 25 or 30. Uh, but you know, if you have all the same size breed and they're a little bit smaller, maybe, then maybe you could fit more if they're all, Brahmas or Cochins or big old uh, buff Orpingtons, you probably, you know, do can do less uh, because they're a little bit bigger. Yeah. Um, and, and they squish they're it. They're a little bit fluffier. <laughs> I mean, in the in the winter in our regular stationary coop, it's totally different. We like want them to squish in and stay warm like this yeah. big ball of chicken and feathers and stuff. But in the summer... They, they usually just they spread out a little, they more. spread out a little bit more. Yeah. They can get cozy if they're a little, <laughs> they're like, Hey, that's my spot. You know, they'll weasel their well, way. What in between happens each other. is <laughs> if you don't have enough roosting space, then they start roosting in your nest boxes and then your nest boxes are full of poop and then you have poopy eggs. So yeah, you got to get the roosting bars. Like you have to have enough for however many birds you have. Yep. For sure. Yeah. Okay, well, that brings us to the main topic Ooh. of the night, which is... We've arrived. Side hustle time. So uh, we're already 43 minutes in. We'll see if we can make sure that this doesn't go <laughs> another hour and 15. Some of, our, a little long some of our live streams <laughs> have been at the two-hour mark. Let's try yeah. and keep that down. But this is something that we're super passionate about. Yeah. Um, because when we sure. moved to a farm, we were like... Part of our reason for moving to this property was to actually start actually start a farm business. Yeah. And we had some caveats to that. We weren't ever planning on being full-time farmers. No. Like that being our only income. Um, but we did also like still keep a little bit of that personal part of it in saying we're going to also be growing food for ourselves right yeah so whatever we grew kind of homesteaders kind of farmers yeah whatever we grew would be to only the quality that we would have for ourselves yeah right and we had some pretty high standards uh for what we wanted to do for ourselves and so it was like well that's just what we're going to sell if we can't sell it then then we'll just grow more, it for ourselves more for us yeah. so anyway having a side hustle and and being able to fund it's, it's expensive. Like, I don't think really realize how expensive it can be. Yeah. Um, and that's even if you are doing a lot to keep the costs down. There's just stuff based on your goals of what you want to do that it just costs money. It costs a lot of money. And the same thing if you're starting a farm, you have you know, a lot of infrastructure. Yeah. You got to build stuff. A, a Siskovich chicken tractor built from all brand new materials just three years ago was almost $400. Yeah. And, and lumber is like three times the cost of what it used to be. It's crazy right now. So yeah, probably five, close to $500 if you're starting from scratch. Right. So, I mean, if you already have a farm and you have a lot of, you know, nails and screws and chicken wire laying around, like I do now, I could probably <laughs> build one for half the price, but right. Uh, and scrap wood, but I mean, for the most part, if you're starting brand new, like we were, we had, we had buildings, which are the big expenses, Yeah. but we didn't have we had... the infrastructure to grow food, grow the food that we wanted right. the way that we wanted. 
Well, we, we wanted had some to have fen- horses. Some fencing, but we didn't really have the appropriate fencing yeah. for what yeah. we wanted to do. If, with, if we wanted yeah. to just have horses, we would have been set. We had yeah. horse stalls, we had fences, we had a horse arena, lit. You could ride horses at night. Well, and we've made a lot of it work for other things, which yeah. is a good thing to do, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, it's really important, I think, and I see a lot of people talking about, especially on Justin Rhodes's member site, talking about how do we afford this and, you know, how do y'all do it and not go bankrupt? And, yeah. And, you know, thoughts about we about that that i think is really what helped us get off the ground and i'm glad that brad's here because brad yeah. is like the king of side hustles and also if you didn't know this uh farmer brad he's on youtube he's also farmerbrad.com and he recently lost his job so if you can oh. check out his website he sells a ton of good stuff there including some waters that we use in our stationary coop yeah um and they've been great too uh, yes they've worked great we did a video about it um and check out his website and see what he has he does a lot of sells a lot of stuff that i know he personally uses and so it's really nice to have it's it's kind of like premiere one if you buy stuff from premiere one especially sheep and goat stuff they use all of that stuff and test it and that's why it's really good stuff because um, it's like field tested by the owners and they don't sell stuff that they don't like and don't use. So anyway, uh, caveat there for farmer Brad, um, he says he has so, uh, like severance benefits for, for a little while. And I can't think of a better time for a farmer to be a part-time farmer to be off of, out of work. Yeah. The busiest time of the year. If we can, and... we can look at it like the, you know, glass half full side. Of yeah. It. So anyway, but you know, speaking of Brad and his job, that's kind of the first thing and the first mistake that I think people think is quitting your day job to start a farm or to well, start their homestead. I mean, I don't know that I would call it a mistake because it depends on what your goals are and what your what your needs are. For us, if we if you had just were like, I'm gonna be a farmer. Yeah, we, we'd be in a bad spot. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we wouldn't have a farm for anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like it wouldn't it wouldn't have been sustainable for us. But there are people who have done it and do do it. But we bought this place with but most the of them assumption have that, some sort of side hustle. Yeah, we bought this place yeah. with the assumption that I would not be Right. I would not be uh you know quitting my job as an engineer. Yeah. So uh, but there are some people that get the bug and, and it takes a lot it, to get going and realize that if you have money coming in, that's your greatest asset, right? Yeah. And because that money is what brings you the freedom to grow, right. And to get into new things. So, uh, you know, if you have an income, don't give it up right away. And if you have an income that is not, uh, flexible, Check out some options. See if you can find something that's a little bit more flexible that can give you some time. So my, you know, for me, I work from home and I worked from home before the pandemic. And it's just a very assumed thing at my workplace. They call it work-life balance. Yeah. That there's going to be times when I'm just not going to be in the office. And, you know, usually they talk about that in terms of you have a doctor's appointment or you have a family thing or a kid has a baseball game that starts early in the in the uh, evening or something, you got to get away a little bit early. But I, I have specific, specifically told my manager, I run a farm and there's certain times of the year where I'm just going to be busy. So, you know, sometimes that means I take vacation days. Like when I'm taking the broilers up to the processor, that's a vacation day for me. But, um, but you know, there's, there's, Part of that work-life balance that I tell my manager is I March and April are just busy. And yeah. so sometimes I'm just going to be like, hey, sorry, all the all the lambs got out. I'll be back <laughs> in 15 minutes or something. Uh, and it's important that you have a job that, you know, can fit with that lifestyle. Yeah. And and if you don't, then 
you know, consider if you can looking for something that will allow you to have this dual lifestyle. Cause you're really starting, you know, let's, let's take someone who is fully like, like I was fully, uh, you know, just in the suburbs working my job or whatever yeah. and wanting to transition to something more than that. Well, it's, it's not an overnight thing. No, it took a lot of, we, we had to do a lot of learning. Yeah. Pre-learning, learning in the midst and sometimes learning after the fact yeah. of things. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, even, so there's that. Don't give up your income if you can't. Yeah. Um, if you can't uh, help it. Second thing is like one of the greatest pieces of advice that I've heard, I hear all the time in like the personal finance community that I spend a lot of time with. But I first think I heard it from Joel Salatin was get out of debt. Like, especially maybe, maybe not the big ones, like your mortgage, if you have one, or if you're buying property and you are, are, are taking out debt for that, but get rid of that car loan, right? Get rid of that student loan. And, and honestly, to be fully, fully transparent, transparent yeah. we have a car loan and a student loan and Obviously, the student loan We're we got before it, I had a farm. Yeah. And and we had a car loan when we moved here. Yep. And we have just made the decision this year, like, I'm turning 40 in July. Like, we're going to just try and bang those out hey, Mom. before yep. my 40th birthday. Yeah. And I think we're going to be able to do it. We just have to keep on. It's it, You got to have a goal and you have to have a plan to reach yeah. that goal. Yeah. And so our plan and our goal basically includes our side hustles as our way to meet that goal. Um, and, you know, alongside that same advice that Joel Salton gave of get rid of your debts, he also, he also tells people save up two years of living expenses. Wow. And, you know, Dave Ramsey's that's a like lot. three to six months. Yeah. Right? Yeah. A thousand dollar emergency fund. Two years. And, that's a big buffer. Well, so Joel's talking about people that are going to go and start a farm. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. I, so I don't then think you, you need, necessarily you need, need some buffer there. Yeah. I don't think you necessarily need that if you're going to ease into it like right. we did or yeah. like us, we're not intending to become full-time farmers. So it's always a good idea. Brad's an example here, yeah. you know, to have a couple of months expenses to just give you that breathing room. Yeah. Yeah. And then once you do get to your farm, don't take on a whole bunch of new debt. Yeah. Just to get started. That was another Joel thing that I hear all the time yeah. from some of the business and entrepreneur podcasts I listen to is that, you know, go lean and go fast, right? Well, but that's where the side hustle comes in. Because if you can bring in a side income, then you can invest in your farm or your business with that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that's where so not only to fund the farm, yeah, and also to to well, basically dreams. take away our debts, yeah, so that we have the freedom to pursue that dream as far as we yeah. can take it, right? Yeah, um, and so you know the liabilities that come with debt is not only just you have a negative a negative balance that's sitting there staring yeah. at you, yeah. for every single month. It also, it basically, the strings attached to that means someone else's priorities are now higher than yours, yeah. right? The bank doesn't necessarily care if you spent it on a tractor and you haven't used that tractor to come up with some income. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they wouldn't give you the money unless you had a plan to do that. But, you know, debt doesn't come just from the bank, right? It's true. You can borrow from your yeah. family and then you're dealing with some issues of, you know, family dynamics, friends, if you have that. Um, and, you know, they can't all be government loans that will be forgiven if you delay them. <laughs> so, um, you know, specifically yeah. student loans, which are very hard to have forgiven uh, until recently. Yeah. So uh, there's those are just kind of some of the basics that, you know, in all honesty, we're not perfect. But if we had to go back and do it again, um, you know, be a lot more uh, focused on removing debts before we were going to go on. And I know there's a whole arbitrage, 
question or, or, or argument that is, it's so cheap to get, to get debt right now. And you can make more money in the stock market than, than you're paying on your debt. And that's great. That's true. And my math mind as an engineer, I, I can write up a spreadsheet to show that it would be more financially feasible, for, fi more financially um, uh, winning in the end to play those numbers against each other. But I really honestly think since money is such a psychological thing that you can... Uh, probably make it out ahead if you pay down those smaller debts because now you're free and you have more to work with and you could probably catch up on investing if you wanted to do that. That's just my feeling on it. I think that's the way it's going to go for us. Um, but yeah, Dulcie, thanks for showing up. Your lawn, your husband's lawn care business has been successful because of the goalie mentality from the beginning. So, um, yeah. and that is actually. And a lot of hard work. And a lot of hard work. Yeah. Brad's a very hard worker. Very so much so. Th that actually is the same mentality that we had with our farm. And yeah. the next point that I had uh, was go slow, build a system, and once you get the system running, put it on cruise control and build the next thing, right? And yeah. One example of that is with our chickens and doing You're broilers. good at that. I'm not. I always want to add another thing. Before the system is Before like Before the going. system's in place. I'm like, can we do, what can we do now? <laughs> That's just puppies? the way I'm running. Can we have puppies? Yeah. She, How about sheep? She's talked to me. Sheep are really stuff. cute. Can I have a pony? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got a pony yet. Nope. No. I don't really want one. No. <laughs> Some things you got to put the foot down on and the pony is one of them for me. Right. And the animals in my house. Yeah. I don't no, like no animals, animals in the house. house. Even no. though we currently have, what, 20 or 30 animals in our house. But they're just baby chicks, and they're in a little. I think there's about thirty, and they are only going to be in the house for like a couple days. Yeah, most of them will be sold this weekend. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so you know, it's important to start small, especially because there's a lot of. I mean, so there's there's quite a few people that are actually getting more into homesteading when they're retiring, and at that point, you have a fixed income, right? So you basically have to, you have to keep within. Uh, a budget of some sort before you can go and, uh, you know, it, it's not like you can just, you, you have to earn more if you want to spend more totally there, unless you wanted to start going in debt again, which again is not a good idea, but back to the chickens, the system that we, that we have in place is basically very similar system that you'll see from like a Salatin or primal pastures. Yeah or um, Siskovich, right? Where every year I just have my checklist of things I need to do to, to grow chicken that year. Yeah. And it's call the processor, call the hatchery, get all your dates set, call the feed guy, get the feed delivery set up, and then figure out your marketing plan. This year, our marketing plan was awesome. I emailed our previous customers and they bought everything. And so we didn't even have to go out and try and find new customers. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and you already have your brooder set up. If you saw Justin Rhodes video today, he said this, he said this exact same thing. There was no emergency when the chickens showed up because the brooder already was set up. And so we changed our brooder around this year because I still didn't really like how we had it last year, but I use Ohio brooders and they were already built. Um, so getting through that and working out a system and then putting on cruise control, the, the cruise control that we're doing for our chickens this year is that I trained my two daughters to do broilers last year. Yeah. Another farmer came to us and said, hey, would you be willing to grow some more chickens because I want to sell more than I have capacity to grow? And so I said, well, here's my daughters. They know how to take care of animals. And they both grew 200 birds. And um, they both grew 100 birds. Yeah. And that was their... You know, I kind of supervised it, but for the most part, they handled it Yeah. Uh, and they got paid for it. So this year, I basically put it up to him again. It's like, do you want to grow our chickens? Yeah. And one of them did, one of them didn't. So one of them we hired as our poultry manager. Yeah. And she, I mean, we got our second batch of chickens on Thursday morning. Yeah. We brought the chickens because the kids were at school. We brought the chickens from the post office to the barn 
opened up the brooder and the the feed in the water and the yep, heat lamps she, were already on. She was had like, everything ready. It Holy cow. So great. <laughs> Earned that paycheck. I mean, I was, I didn't know that she had done that. I, at yeah. some point earlier, I'm a planner. I said, hey, I told her, you got to get this ready because there's another hundred broilers coming yeah. this week. And it was just poof. Well, and she, she just did it. <laughs> she she had it all ready to go for the first batch too when I went and got them uh, the week before. Yeah. Uh, and brought them home that everything was ready. I just had to dip their beaks and put them in. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of been our mantra is start one thing, put it on cruise control, and start the next thing. Right. So uh, we didn't do that and that's the reason why our advice is as it is is that we learned that it's easy to get overwhelmed it's it's easy to get overwhelmed when everything is running as it should because you have so much going on at the same time right? yeah and so i think it's really it's it's really like for your own sanity to be able to get that cruise control and know how it's supposed to work and have done it before before you add something new then then that's you know when you can say all right there's one thing that's going haywire at least all the other things are running as they should rather than oh i bought goats this year i bought sheep this year i got a couple of chickens i got meat birds now and and then everything is all new and it's all coming you know there's a storm that's going to blow through and everybody's going to get out and <laughs> You know, that's just the way it works when it rains, it pours. Right. So uh, I would just encourage you to just try one thing at a time. I know that when you get started, it's really exciting and you want to do it all. But, you know, if you're going to do two things at a time, do a garden and an animal, because if the garden like goes to goes crazy and there's a disaster, there's no there's no like live animals in yeah involved and there's no neighbors calling you and saying uh you know your garden ran over here and is ruining my driveway or something <laughs> like like a chicken might um or digging up my plants yeah. or something like that so uh well, if you're gonna if you're gonna multitask to... do a garden because they don't run away <laughs> and it's easy to start with uh like a little backyard flock of chickens too yeah. Um, that can produce eggs for you pretty quickly and they can help with fertilizing your garden and stuff like that. But they aren't, um, I've always said like laying hens are the lowest like maintenance animal that a person could have. Like, yeah. And actually I don't even consider chickens in a garden to be two separate things anymore. No, they're pretty. They're, they're combined. so like complementary yeah, to yeah, one another sure. that it's you almost wonder once you have them both how you ever gardened without and and the answer is that you probably spent a lot more time or a lot more money on on fertilizer yeah and pulling weeds before you had chickens so that's that's kind of i almost consider them to be one one physical unit together so yeah. So the last part about that system part of thinking is just train someone to do it if you can. Yeah. Um, one thing I learned from Justin when we were down there, I spent a lot of time talking to him about business stuff, is that he's currently hiring someone to edit his vlog now. And it's yeah. someone that he had used to edit other content of his. And he said, how am I going to pay the editor? And I said, from the money you make? And he's like, no, the editor pays for the editor right and i was like oh, what you know and it's it's for someone that's not like born into the business world right and and is kind of new to that basically by having someone else edit his vlog he frees up two to three hours a day yeah so if he can find some other way to generate income in those two to three hours a day that's more than he's paying for editing that's a win right Assuming that the editor works out and, you know, his editor is Dan Omen, is a friend and yeah, is yeah. proven to be good at this sort of thing. So it's a little bit lower risk. But, you know, there's a little bit of overhead that comes with communicating with him about what he wants to do with the video and then having Dan do it and having to review it, which normally he'd have that in his head. But, you know, hiring someone to do something so that you have more time to do something that 
furthers your goals and can produce more income is, you know, that's exactly the kind of mentality that you want to have is don't waste your money and time on things that, that aren't going to be able to further you towards your goals. And if your goals is to grow your homestead, you're just, you're going to need, you're going to need money uh, to do that. (laughs) So that's, um, that, that, that was just really profound to me. And, and I don't really know why, cause it, 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 it makes sense. Right. Um, so I, that was just really great advice and I really appreciate Justin, you know, just kind of blurting that stuff out and, you know, dropping mind, mind blowing advice to me, uh, pretty much the whole time that, that I was there. Um, so how do you do all this? Uh, how, how do you get to that point where you want to move and maybe you want to quit your job or maybe you want to farm full time? Uh, and for us, the reason we're talking about this is that you have a, the possibility of what's called a side hustle. And a side hustle is just, you know, other work that you do that I guess would be considered not your main income. Yeah. Is that a good definition of it? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of funny because it, started out as like a side hustle for you, but now it's my thing. Yeah. So, so fully, but, but previously my work has always been at home with being home with kids or homeschooling and things like that. And so in a way it's a side hustle for me, but it's the only thing I'm getting paid for. Yeah. So, so I don't know, you know, full disclosure, we grow sheep, turkeys, and chickens, and we did, a, as you see in the chat, a couple of livestock yeah. guardian dog puppy litters. litters. The puppies, they made money. Well, yes and no. Well, in the long term, they don't make money. The puppies themselves, they make yes. money. Puppies do make money, um, and it's the kind of thing where if we continue to do it, uh, it could, I think it could come close to breaking even on like paying for our dogs that yeah. we keep. So if you wanted to, but, it, it, it breaks even because it would break even because we have dogs that we're keeping on the farm. Yeah. We have two dogs that we're keeping on the farm and they're big dogs and they eat a lot. <laughs> of food. Oh, I mean, in comparison to other big dogs, they actually don't. But, yeah, but, but it's, they do. It's a lot. Of money. I mean, it's a lot more than like your little, you know, so pom- pomeranian or yeah. something. <laughs> Which we wouldn't do pomeranians no. to to you know they guard, have to guard the, the sheep, right? They have to live in the house, and we don't have animals. Anymore, so <laughs> so that, yeah. So that is an operation that let's just let's call it neutral, right? Yeah. Chickens, on the other hand, chickens make money. Turkeys. Well, turkeys make a lot of meat money. Meat chickens make money. Okay, I was talking layers, about meat chickens. Layers, you have to get to a certain scale before you can make money on eggs, and there, I don't think there's any possibility for us to reach that scale. Yeah, like so, we we don't have the so egg layers anything. at the scale. They're we're a at, loss for us at the scale we're at. We we have transitioned to just egg layers for our own personal consumption. Yeah, uh, turkeys. Turkeys are the most turkeys are profitable weird. thing that we do. Yeah. And that's why I want to continue growing them. I keep telling people I like raising turkeys more than chickens. It isn't just because I like turkeys more. I like money, too. <laughs> well. So uh, they take longer, obviously. They're harder to get to the processor, uh, but they have a lot of personality, and uh, they are actually much better at ridding your pasture of insects than chickens are. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, so and I they, love turkeys. they manure and fertilize like crazy. Yeah. When they're, when they get to be bigger, like November 1st around here, it's like dog size. Manure <laughs> it's so they drop crazy. On the yeah. Um, but they're also messy too. They're messier. They might be messier than chickens. So feed waste can be a problem with turkeys. So, of those four things, right? We have dogs, chicken, meat chickens. Uh, oh, we didn't talk about sheep. Sheep, yeah. sheep do not make money at our well, at our scale. We're working on it. 
Don't count it's them fair. out yet. I'm, I'm working just talking on it. about what we've done yes. so far. Currently, to this point, our sheep have not made money. They yeah. they are a loss. And the the point of of going through these and you know being transparent yeah. about it is that there's a certain level of scale where any one of those operations could be profitable enough to live on. Right? Yeah. Uh, and because of our decision to stay as part-time farmers, livestock farmers, uh, we don't really have anything to tell you if you want to be a, do a CSA or plant, d- no. do vegetables. Well, I mean, we never really you, had any no. intention of doing that no. and selling because it you would garden involve for us. Yeah. I garden for fun and for us. And, but we never really had an intention to do that as a business pursuit because it would just involve too much time yeah. away from the house. Uh, we were, we did not think that Saturday morning sitting in a stall at a farmer's market was for us. No. Karen would rather sleep in. I'd rather go fishing. And well, I'm not, I'm also not a gardener. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, I, I enjoy the garden. I like the, the end product, but it isn't my like passion. I don't love I'm willing, but I don't, it isn't something that I'm like driven to do all on my own. Yeah. Yeah. So we can only really talk about the livestock side of things here. So any one of those could be profitable, but what we realized after getting into this year or two, there's a scale at which that becomes profitable. Yeah. And the one we used to sell eggs and we used to sell them for $5 a dozen. Which and, a lot of people in our area were like, oh my goodness, $5 a dozen. And I'm like, listen, if you're selling your eggs for anything less, you are paying people to take them away. Right. So and, we are actually could not, we, we couldn't overcome that competition yeah. of people that were losing money on eggs. Yeah. And so we just decided to get out of that game because yeah. we it didn't spark joy, Marie Kondo, <laughs> yeah. for us. And it also was like, we love, I love eggs. I have yeah. 20 eggs a week and at least probably. And, um, and so there, there's enough in that for us, but the amount of time it takes to do eggs and to do it properly, which properly means cleaning them, which yeah. is probably the hardest part or the yeah. most time consuming part. We just weren't, if one of our kids wanted to get into it, you know, we'd yeah. probably look into that a little bit more, Yeah, but uh, it just wasn't for us. So we just dropped it. So, you know, that's, although we, it is one of the, I mean, when, when we, when I post things about our farm and our farm products and things like that, it is the top, like, Oh, do you have eggs? Do you also have eggs. People Everybody wants eggs. eggs. Um, but it's like, if we were going to actually $9 a dozen, if we were going to sell them at the price that we would need to sell them at to make it worth, worth our time and worthwhile in our area, people wouldn't pay it. Yeah. So it's kind of like, no, but we do have some farmer friends who have eggs. And so I just send them over there. I'm just like, Oh, here, I've got a couple, a list, a couple yeah. farms that Happy to support eggs other farmers. And you can get your eggs from them and it'll be great. Yeah. So, Happy yeah. to support other local farms in our area. Yeah. For sure. For sure. So. Um, I think we should talk about our side hustle, honey. Yeah. So <laughs> we have our, we have all those things and, and with the scale that they're at, there's some things that we don't want to get bigger. Yeah. And there's some things that we really want to focus on. We really want to focus on sheep. Yeah. But they don't make money. Uh, I really want to, <laughs> I really want to focus more on turkeys. So that's one yeah. of the reasons why I gave the chickens to our daughter. It's a yeah. way for her to make money that she's passionate about. Yeah. She wants to buy a car or whatever she wants to buy. And I hope she wants to buy a car. Please buy a car. Yeah. Um, and I, and so that we can focus on the things that we want to get. And I realize not everyone's families in that situation where they can hand it off to a capable yeah. child, but you, they'll get there. If they're younger, you'll get sure. there. Right. Um, well, and I think look, looking at Justin Rhodes kids, they can get there a lot earlier than a lot of people think yeah, they could. They can get there a lot earlier than you think. Um, especially yeah. if you're out there doing it with them. That's yeah. the best way to get kids to do their chores and their farm yeah. chores is that if they're doing them with you. 
So all of those things came to a head, I think, last year when we said, uh, okay, well, if, if our main operation of sheep isn't being covered by the profits we make in turkeys and chickens, yeah. then what are we going to do? Because at that point, we would say, okay, well, it's the business sort of thing isn't really happening. We're just going to, everything's just going to shift over to being growing food for ourselves and the sheep would become pets. Yeah. Uh, and we didn't want to do that. So uh, I was really into learning a lot about finances last year. That was like my 2020. I just nerded out on personal finance <laughs> and uh, read a lot of books. And I was on a Facebook page and I saw, uh, a, it's called Choose FI, the choosefi.com. It's Choose Financial Independence is what it's called. Yeah. And it's it's not really Dave Ramsey. They they have a lot of very similar, uh, similar, you know, tenants of personal finance, but they also are um, more about how to achieve financial goals in not as strict of a seven step pattern. Dave Ramsey is more of, you know, very strict about what he, what he has those goals and, and this group is not as strict, but there was a Facebook group that every Tuesday there's, there's a post that says like, what's your side hustle? So that, I saw some lady said, I resell used mattresses on Facebook and Craigslist. And uh, I was like, what? So I messaged, and I was like, I, I wasn't really interested. I just kind of wanted to know what. Yeah, it seemed like such a, like, that's, how? A, that's a thing? <laughs> Who, wait, what kind of used mattress? I mean, how long are they used? Yeah, so I I started talking to her there and she's like, yeah, it's real easy. All you need is a vehicle that can move mattresses and the ability to store them and the ability to sell them on Craigslist and Facebook. And, um, you know, we just, I, I just started, I actually said to Karen, I said, Hey, I'm going to do this mattress thing and Maddie's going to do it with me. I'll pay her for every mattress we do. And it's just for fun, you know, some fishing and hunting money or whatever. And I, I, you know, just spending, spending fun money. Um, and I, I got two or three mattresses and I sold them and, and I had a couple hundred dollars <laughs> and Karen looks at me. She's like, where did that come from? Oh, well, there's well, that. How can I there get, was that. How can I get a couple hundred dollars? But what it, the other piece of it was you sold the first few and it was like, oh, that was easy. And then, then you got, you went and picked up some more because that's part of the job. Like you have to go and. And then didn't like sell quite as quickly and you were starting to get a little like, oh no, what did I get into? Started yeah. getting sad faced about it. And, and you were, and I think you had some stuff going on at work and whatever, like your day job. And I was like, wait, you just got to post, post these on, on like Facebook and stuff. I was like, well, I can do that. And I love selling stuff on yeah. Craigslist and Facebook. And I was like, I can do that. I know how to sell on Facebook. So I was like, show me what I need, you know, where's the information or whatever. And, and then I think I had the, the next like half a dozen mattresses sold that, like that week. And she I was found her calling. And folks. I was like, I was made to do this. <laughs> Let's be honest. So fast forward, you know, Get me some more mattresses. a couple, a couple months later. Yeah. And here's Jack in our shop sitting on. 35 or so mattresses. Yeah. This was just, and this, this was a portion of a shipment we took on. So this was like a third of, of the mattresses that we had at that particular time. So there's mattresses everywhere on our property. And actually it wasn't just that Karen found her calling in this. Our property was actually kind of made for this. If it you, really was. If you see in this photo, like we don't have, we have a pole barn but it's the previous owner turned it into a shop. It's insulated yeah. and it has a floor in it. And so it's basically like a lot of storage can happen there. And so I told the lady, I said, yeah, we have storage. And I just bought this pickup truck for the farm and for a family vehicle to fit all six of us. So we can do it. And I got, I, I have some, you know, teenage kids with strong backs that can help me move it. And, um, we 
just jumped in on it. And then all of a sudden, how long would you say it was before we realized that this was like legit? Oh, I don't think it real. I don't think it took me more than a week or two. <laughs> it didn't take. Long. I was like, I, you know, this is great. It was, it was so good. Cause I, it was something easy that I could do when I had time and not do when I didn't have time. And, um, and I was making real money. Like yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't just like, you know, like, Ooh, this could, we could go out to dinner one time. It was like, Oh, this is like a actual income. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it turned into like one of these opportunities that people are constantly talking about of there's all of this, you know, work from home economy, right. Where side hustles can be done. You don't have to go to an office. You don't have to have yeah. a traditional job like that. And, and a lot of that, I think people have seen through sort of the network marketing, you know, selling essential oils, selling Norwex, selling bags and that sort of stuff as, as a, as a very common income for stay at home moms. Yeah. And what we kind of happened upon here is also a great income for stay at home moms. Obviously we have to go pick up mattresses and stuff, but yeah. we, we sort of had everything all in place to be able to do this yeah. and start making money right away. So one of the great things about it is that when you pick up a mattress, we sell it and a portion goes to us, a portion goes to the company. We don't give them their portion until we sell it. Yeah. So what's, what's, what's really we, nice. We don't about have to that. like prepay for our inventory. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's really nice that we aren't, we, we didn't have to prepay for those hundred and some odd mattresses that we got in a big shipment to get started. They just gave them to us and now we're selling them after we've proven that we're not going to steal them, <laughs> not <laughs> yeah. going to dump them in a ditch Can you imagine? Um, or, you know, just run away with them, I guess. They, they've had other people in the company that have just disappeared with <laughs> a I, bunch which, of mattresses. Which I'm like, how do you even go about doing that? <laughs> I mean, like it's, like a truckload of mattresses, like that's not a small thing. Yeah. I mean, like you got to think know. of a way to get rid of all of that. Right. So, uh, you know, all of this to, to say, we, we still say to ourselves, honey, you know, did you ever think that in the middle of a global pandemic, in the middle of all the changes that we're going through schooling with our kids and things in the rest of the world that, you know, we started 2020 half of the year that just six months later that our our free time would be kind of consumed with talking to people on Facebook and selling them used mattresses. Never. Never. <laughs> I never imagined that I would sell mattresses. Right. And so uh, it you was know. it was not in my like someday I want to be. <laughs> but I was I think I was born for it. You were born. For I am um, oh, sorry about that, folks. I really like talking with people and I like helping them find something that, that they're, that they're happy with. And I also like, cause I've tried other, like more like network marketing type things before. And yeah, if you need essential oils you and just, the, the piece of like engaging that, with people and, and educating them and sharing with them what I know and what I, what's worked for me, I'm happy to do, but um, and I enjoy the piece that where you have to like, almost like chase people down and <laughs> try to get them to buy the product. I'm like, I have zero interest in doing that. Whereas this, it's like, I'm putting it out there. Everybody needs a bed and the people who are looking for one come to me. Yeah. So it's, it's like, it's pretty great to sell a mattress. You're like, do you know anyone who sleeps? Yeah. <laughs> it's the same way with farming. Do you know anyone who eats? Yeah. Right. I'm like. So th this, this discussion isn't about mattresses, right? No. Like this is just what apparently just fell into our laps. <laughs> yeah. It's about finding something that can sustain your, like if you have goals and dreams with your farm or your homestead, um, but you, you, you know, you don't have the means to like, just fund that, uh, because of something else that has come into your life. Like you, you, then you need some sort of side hustle that can get things going because in order to do it, like 
it requires resources and often there's a lot up front before you get anything back. I mean, like the sheep, for example, um, they could become sustainable and they could become profitable, but for them to get there, there's a lot of cost that goes in before you ever start getting that profit out. So let's talk, so, let's talk about that, right? So what would yeah. we need to do to make our sheep pay for themselves and start turning a profit where we could say, give up on mattresses because we're going to devote it to sheep. Oh, give up on mattresses? Give up on... Yeah, I don't on, know that they'll ever be that profitable. Well, yeah. So, so let, that's, let's just I mean, say, that's another thing too. It's like, you kind of have to look at what your goals are and then decide what's worth your time. Like, I love my sheep. I don't want to get rid of them. Well, let's um, just be hypothetical to okay. someone that is going to do a side hustle as a means so to an end. So I have calculated out that we would need to sell twice as many lambs as we keep sheep over winter to pay just to pay for their hay. Mm -hmm. Then if we, if we had twice as many lambs to sell as we were keeping over winter, then their wool and their hides that like anything we did with their fiber would be a bonus. However, you have to, that's a, a thing where you have to pay up front and then you don't get the money out of your fiber until you've sold it, mm -hmm. until you've sold it all. Yeah. Because, you know, you have to sell a good chunk of it before you're, before you've paid back what you had to pay up front. So this, of consequential, this is one of the reasons why Joel Salatin tells people to grow meat chickens first. Right. They're, they're pretty easy to sell. People eat chicken. They're quick and profitable. You have eight weeks from when you pay to when you get paid, which is a very short timeline for farming. Yeah. Um, and you, you know, it, it does Cows not. Cows are like a year and a half. It does not cost a lot to get into them. Yeah. Now let's take, say, if you're going to do feeder pigs or feeder lambs or something, you're months into it. Right. And you have a more, little bit more infrastructure. And at least with lambs, it's going to be a little bit harder to get rid of them. Pigs, on the well, other hand, will be easier to get rid of, but it's a lot more costly to get them up to a processor if you need, if you're going to sell them, yeah. you know, to the public, not just friends or family. And, um, you know, they're kind of, they're a little bit easier than lambs, I'd say. On the to scale sell, we've but been maybe on, though, we have handle. never had, we have never had an issue selling <laughs> the amount of lamb that we have available for sale. Yeah. Um, and in fact, every year that we've been raising sheep, we've had more people that wanted lamb than we had available to sell. Mm -hmm. So, and that, that, has continued and I don't imagine that that will never not be the case yeah. for us because we're, we, we won't get to a scale where we would be producing so much excess that we have to like hunt down customers. Yeah. Um, but it would be nice to be able to reach a point where we are kind of meeting the customer, the, maybe base level customer load that we have. Yeah. I mean, we've just, we've only had a handful of lambs to sell each in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so in order yeah. to grow that flock though, um, you know, we do rotational grazing. Right? Yeah. And that's, that's just, that's one of our ideals that we're not going to, we're not going to change, right? That's how we want to manage our land. That's how we manage our flock to keep the flock costs down, right? Cause we don't have to, have parasite problems and, and that sort of thing if we do rotational grazing right. And so by doing that, that means that in order to grow a flock by, by that size, as well as be able to manage them in a reasonable amount of time, we would need to buy a lot of more infrastructure to do that. Yeah. We would need to buy and per, specifically perimeter fencing. Yeah. And that on our property, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars, right? Right. If we wanted to, fence in our whole property. So when you're thinking about doing our, you know, our side hustle and 
reaching our farm and homestead dreams. Don't let anyone, you know, tell you that it's not okay to raise and, and earn money in some way that isn't the farm, right. right? We are selling mattresses for the means of reaching a couple of personal goals, like getting out of debt, yeah. a couple of fun goals, like going on vacations to Europe and, and then also upgrading the infrastructure of our farm so that I, I want it to be where I have two or three flocks of sheep. You know, we have rams and we have lambs and we have ewes. And it's like, I'm going to pull this fence and they go to the next pasture and then I'm going to shut it and give them some water. And then that's it. Yeah. Like no more moving fences, because let's be honest, moving fences is hard work. It is. Especially when you're and just doing most, Premier One. Everyone loves Premier One. It's the most time consuming But it's time consuming of... to make new paddocks. Right. But the fence, moving the fences is the most time consuming piece of our sheep farming that we do. Yeah. Like uh, everything else is actually a pretty easy thing. I mean, you know, you go out and you fill up water buckets and whatever, and we've got systems in place to make that efficient and, and not hard. And, but the and fence, moving the fences is, it's a lot of work and it takes time. When, when you think about even those other things that are simple, like water, right? How do we get water out to our pastures? How do we get water out to our yeah. pastures? Well, we have like a tank thing that we put on the, the ATV. ATV the ATV costs $5,400. Yes. Now we use the ATV for a lot of stuff. It was totally worth every penny. I think every penny as well as, grou as well as grouse hunting. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it's, it's like those sorts of things that make getting water a 10 minute task instead of an all morning task yeah. are the sorts of things that you're just trading money for time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, a ram pump won't work for us, Brad, because we don't have the elevation on the water on our property. Um, so, uh, that infrastructure is like how you grow your farm. And so the side hustle is basically what's going to do that. Now we could skimp on a lot of other things on my income to make that difference between expenses and income go higher. But one of the things that I have heard a lot and Justin Rhodes actually said to me last week is like, you can only skim your expenses so far, right? Yeah. You can only cut down lattes at Starbucks until you have zero lattes per week. Right. And then, and then what and are you going to cut? And even that, right. And even then it's like, I don't know, you look at things like that and, and you kind of go, I mean, I'm sure there are people where that's like a major expense for them. For us, it's like, yeah, that isn't necessarily even a weekly or even a monthly thing that we go and do. Yeah. So I mean, to cut it out, it's like, yeah, I mean, okay, I don't know how, I, I have no idea how much we would, we spend on at the coffee shop, but like what, 50 bucks a year or something? Like, not me, much. yeah, it wouldn't like, it's much cheaper to make your own coffee. It wouldn't pay for anything. <laughs> uh, so the question I think about what I was talking about, what I want to do with sheep is not be able to move Premier One fence is what fencing do you have in mind besides Premier One? We could still possibly use Premier One fencing. What I want to be able to do is have enough Premier One fencing that each paddock is surrounded. On our property, we have long, skinny pastures yeah. that it's that it is woven wire perimeter fence that holds the charge, and then just long stretches of either a Gallagher Smart fence or a Premier One fence that just subdivide the pastures. And there's basically there's basically perimeter perimeter fence on the top and the bottom, and then on the two sides are uh, one hundred and sixty four foot Premier One uh, fence that are basically pull up, and you know you just kind of can. Right now we basically leapfrog them. It would be nice to have more semi permanent fencing that yeah. can stay out there all year that yeah. you don't have to that we never have to move right. And yeah. So. The, pad the paddocks are already subdivided 
And when they come into the first paddock of the pasture, they just progress their way through that until they get to the end. You open a gate and they go into the next pasture and, and then move on. It, it makes a little bit more sense if you saw what our how our property was laid out, maybe. Yeah. But the idea is that there is semi-permanent fencing that's available out there that is for rotational grazing. Yeah. And it's expensive, right? It's not more expensive than uh, Premier One per foot, but you're going to put up a whole lot more of it to to put up for us, you know, yeah. nine acres worth of paddocks. Right. So um, we love Premier One fencing. Don't get me wrong. It, yeah. It's what has basically put our farm into production, right? Yeah. The other thing though, also would be just the time that it would take to, to uh, train your, train your animals, right? Greg Judy has his sheep on one single strand of wire and fence jumpers I, get cold. <laughs> so. I cannot imagine I can't imagine that being actually working. I just, I don't know. Well, he's a pretty aggressive. I know, but he, ha <laughs> yeah, but he has a lot of sheep to work with too. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, for on, a, on our scale, like it's not even comparable because on our scale, well, we would have had to call everything we've ever had. Um, I mean, we did have one major fence jumper and he did go into the freezer. As but, soon as possible. <laughs> but, Couldn't get him in the freezer fast enough. But the rest of them, I mean, you know, if they want, if they see the fresh grass on the other side, they're, they've all been known to figure out a way to get over there on occasion. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the other thing. You, you lose fence jumping if your pastures are good and you move them in time, right? If they always have food, they, there's no reason for them to choose to, to jump the fence other than a predator coming through that just pushes them out. And that's where things like donkeys and livestock guardian dogs come in. However, one thing that you have going for you, at least with sheep, is that if one jumps out, they almost immediately want to get back in because they're now separated from all of their friends, right? Which is like a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing and a curse. Sometimes because sometimes they're just like some, spazzing out. They'll then... spaz out. They'll try and get in. They'll do more damage getting back in than they did coming out. And sometimes they get their heads stuck in those loops of a premier one fence. So I have just wandered out to the pasture once to do something else and saw something that looked a little odd. And it was a sheep that I have no idea how, but it managed to get its head stuck in a premier one sheep fence in there. And it was just standing there frothing at the mouth, just getting shocked every second. And, you know, from your one it lived and it was right. fine, by the it way. It lived and it was fine. Yeah. I had to cut the fence to get it out, though. I have no idea how it got its head in there because it was reaching into a place that had no vegetation whatsoever that it could have been eating. So that's where single strands of wire would work really well because they can still stick their head through it and get zapped, but they won't necessarily get caught on the sides. So we use a Gallagher Smart Fence right now for most of our sheep moves and for most of their paddocks because it's a lot more it's a lot less likely that the sheep are going to get um that they're going to that they're going to get injured if they get caught in it the the benefit to the premier one netted fencing versus the gallagher though is that in when we have moves where we need to disconnect from electricity for a short time or whatever, as we're moving, shifting things around Yeah. with our sheep being trained. To like the if you're going to load them into a trailer. Or yeah. Something. With our sheep being trained to the premier fencing, they don't jump over it. Um, and when we're moving and stuff like that, we can contain them with the premier fencing, even when it's not electrified, but the Gallagher fencing, if we take the electricity off of that, those sheep are out of that, those three strands in a hot second. Like they, they seem to know that the electricity is off and there's fresh grass three feet that way. Yeah. So yeah. And there have been many, uh, sheep chasing moments <laughs> as we have learned how to like correctly do things so that we aren't chasing sheep. Yeah. And you know, some of that is just animals, some of it's the sheep, and some of it's just us learning what we're doing, right? So 
you can't fault them necessarily for getting out every time, but it's, it's just the reality of it. Um, so anyway, the point of all this though, is being able to get that infrastructure in place would require significant startup funds that we, you know, aren't going to be able to get in a reasonable amount of time just from trying to bootstrap the farm. So we either start getting a lot more animals, breeding a lot more, and maybe buying feeder lambs, and then just sort of try and make it through. Or we find something like the mattresses that we can, that we can, you know, do pretty much in spare time and uh, is actually fairly profitable. So the, the last point that I wanted to make about side hustles is choose something that actually makes money that's worth your time that you enjoy doing, right? So we didn't know that we would enjoy selling mattresses, um, but it is a lot of fun because you get to meet a lot of people and they come to the farm and we've had spontaneous farm tours from people that came to look at mattresses and, and that's always fun as well. Um, but, you know, there are other side hustles that we tried with our farm. Like uh, if you look in this barn right here where Jack is sitting, if it had been one year earlier, that barn would have been full of people's boats. And because we we did winter storage for yeah. people. And the, which in, was fine. But which was fine. It, it was we were really... using... We were using the space. Yeah. It, it would have just sat empty otherwise. Right. But if you if we store three boats in there that people are paying for, we're talking six or seven hundred dollars. And they're and they're there for five to six months, right? Just the stack of mattresses that Jack is sitting on <laughs> in here made more money than that than, whole than thing six of... months of boats sitting yeah, there. Yeah. And he's only sitting on five mattresses. And it totally depends on what brand of mattresses those are. But easily, we made more money on on just those, right? So I'm not, like, again, this isn't about mattresses specifically. It's about choosing something that is worth your time that you can do, that yeah. you enjoy, that yeah. actually brings money in. So, like, you know, we've started with things that we said no to. We said no to eggs. Yeah. We said no to... Um, Brad, you mentioned renting out our sheep for 4-H. We said no to that kind of stuff because honestly, it just, it really wasn't worth the time. And our sheep would not be judged well in 4-H because no. we don't breed them like people breed we're champion. Not we're not raising show, an show, show animals, livestock, right? yeah. <clears throat> well, and the other thing is too, is that um, because like, our management style is to put like the least amount of inputs into our animal as possible. And that includes, you know, uh, medication and vaccines and things like that. Well, if we had our sheep being rented out for, uh, for each and they were leaving our property and coming back, the possibility of, like cross contamination of diseases and things like that, or parasites that we don't currently have on our farm that they could pick up and bring back is pretty high. Yeah. And so then the end re result of that, that would be that could wipe a whole flock out. Well, or it would mean that we have to, you know, we would have to use things, products that we prefer not to use. Like we don't want to lose our flock. Um, and we, we would, medicate or whatever if needed but as of right now i mean we're like five years in with sheep and um and by rotationally grazing and just following good practices with that we're able to manage our sheep without having a deworming schedule um at all yeah. So, and, and we have healthy sheep and we have lambs that grow nice and big and they make it to butcher and, um, and we have customers that are very happy to have a product that hasn't been treated with any of those, pro those other products. So, yeah. um, it's, it, it would, mm -hmm. it's like, and we're not against 4-H, so don't, 
Yeah. I mean, my, our kids, our kids, our kids have done 4-H and, uh, I mean, Maddie uses, does 4-H with her chickens and stuff like that. But as far as renting out and having, uh, animals leave and come back, um, possibly multiple times in a season, just, I don't know for us, it, it wasn't worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, I just, I, there's two questions on here that I want to answer, but I wanted to do one thing first, which was to just go and show you two things that I found that would be helpful if you're interested and uh, just to generate some ideas. One is this website called Side Hustle Nation. I've heard a lot of people talk about this, um, specifically the podcast being a good, a good reference for just we never thought that selling used mattresses was a thing, right? And we never thought that it could be so good for us. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes you just need to get out there and see what else is available. Uh, the second one, and that's sidehustlenation.com. The second one is uh, this offincome.com. And it's off farm. Nope. It's offincome.com. Oh, okay. and it's called off farm income. Okay. And Sorry. it's a podcast. And uh, the guy who, runs this site was a speaker at our sustainable farming association of Minnesota oh. annual conference. And, uh, and he was just a joy to listen to. Uh, and so Who he's, uh, I forget what his name was, but he's oh. specifically, um, specifically has this podcast geared towards farmers, uh, and homestead folks who have their land, but need to generate some income off of that and yeah. listen to a couple episodes. And they they were all just really top, Top notch, really high quality. So that's just two things I wanted to share with you guys, just to get a better, you know, handle on just drumming, drumming up some ideas, you know, yeah. of things that, you know, maybe, maybe you're into gumball machines or ATMs. There's a guy who sell has Bitcoin ATMs. He says he makes a ton of money on it. So, um, you know, I wouldn't be into that, but maybe you are. All right. So the two questions from Spruni Farm. Spruni Farm, let me know if I said that right. And thank you for joining, by the way. I don't think we've seen you before, but thank you for commenting. That's what makes this fun is, is chatting with people who we've never met before and don't know. Um, and what about breeding chickens? Breeding chickens, I think, is a fantastic idea. So good of an idea that we're doing that. Yeah. Well, our, our, our daughter's, our daughter's doing, doing that. Yeah. So she wanted to do chickens, anything having related related to chickens. The egg thing didn't work out. The meat chickens thing is like profitable and it's work and it's easy, but it's not fun for a girl who literally loves chicken, loves chicken. Like every T-shirt she has seems to be chicken themed. <laughs> well, and she's happy to do the meat chickens. Yeah. But she, like, she doesn't have, like, a, oh, my gosh, it's, I can't believe it. It doesn't spark joy. These, right. As much it, it, as. It doesn't. She's happy to do having, it, but it doesn't yeah. bring her joy. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't spark joy in the way that she has, um, you know, when with her, like, various breeds. So what we did is we told her, okay, if you want to breed chickens, let's do that. But you have to get breeds that are rare. Because you can do rare breeds and just people will pay for that, right? And so it was a really good, it was a really good uh, lesson for her about supply and demand. So her grandfather got a bunch of hatching eggs of Bielfelders. And Bielfelders are relatively rare. And it was a breed that Maddie, our daughter, really liked. So she got those hatching eggs, she hatched them out. And granted, you know, it's close to a year from when she got them to when she actually started, started selling them. But yeah. we have a ton of baby chicks at our house right now of various ages. And we, you just put them up for sale. Well, so she and did got this huge waiting list of people. Yeah. And tomorrow, how many people are coming tomorrow to pick up chicks that were born just this week? Three, I it's think. Like three but, that are coming just tomorrow. Yeah. So she hit. So this she hatched chicks in in January or February, and those chicks are she's using at the fair with 4-H. Mm -hmm. um, so those ones she kept. She may sell them later in the summer once she's done with the fair, but uh, those ones stayed. Now the hatch that she just did this last week. Um, on the Milfleur de Clays, she got a 90% hatch rate. 
and on the uh, Beal Felders, she got a 75% hatch rate. So um, yeah, she's doing, the hatch rate is, has really improved and is doing great. And um, those all, I think she's got 30 or 32 chicks upstairs right now, and they're all going to be sold. None of them will stay. So Spruni and Brad are talking in here about how people and tractor supply, everything's just selling out, right? Yeah. And you know, that, that really is not necessarily just because of like pandemic, right? Like selling yeah. chicks online was lucrative before there was a huge, Oh, for sure. <laughs> for there's a huge demand and supply imbalance last year. Well, and the thing that's hard with buying chicks from the hatchery for, especially for people who just want a backyard flock is that a lot of uh, hatcheries have a minimum order and, and a lot of people that, you know, maybe they've, they live in a city or something and maybe they can only have, you know, four or five hens and they can't have roosters and whatever. And so in order to order from a hatchery, they have to figure out what they're going to do with a rooster. If they get one, they have to figure out, you know, they have to, they'd have to like, order with other people or something like there's all these kind of things that complicate that. And so hatching, uh, at home and then selling locally for us, um, is something that works out really well. And people are, are happy to pay because they can buy the number of chicks that they want. Yeah. And, um, like the Bielfelders are auto sexing. So that means at hatch, the males have a different coloring to them than the females. So we, we can tell people a hundred percent whether they're getting a, a pullet or a cockerel yeah. and, um, and it works out great. So as you can see, we, we didn't just hatch eggs, right? We were pretty strategic about which ones? Well, Grandpa helped with that. Yes, the strategy. He, he was very strategic, but <laughs> but we were very strategic about the ones that we chose because they were in short supply. They were sex linked, so we could sell to backyard people who and give them a you know a one hundred percent guarantee uh, for the Bielfelders that this is not going to be a rooster. Yeah. Right, and um, you know we also have. A daughter who's just crazy about it and handles the whole thing and also is paying i mean right now she uses her mattress money right yeah and her broiler money to pay for her chickens to pay for <laughs> yeah. her chickens so we don't spend she's, any money she's now. using her side hustle she's using her side hustle to yeah. fund another side hustle yeah. to do whatever right she has more money than all of her friends um <laughs> so she's the one with the car that drives them around too well she doesn't own a car she has access. To, she we, has her license. We supply her with a car. Yeah. She puts gas in it. Yeah, she's she's good that way. That's the other thing. She has all this money. She's been putting gas in the car. Yeah. So um, it's pretty great. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, again, it's not just about oh, just let's go try and sell baby chicks, right? Like put some thought into what you think you can sell. I would even go for, as far to say as put it on Craigslist and say that you have them and. Yeah. See who, see what pops up. If nobody wants your I am Ceramis, then don't grow those. If you can't, if the phone is ringing off the hook, then that's, you've just validated that as a fantastic idea, right? Yeah. So I think. Uh, well, we, we actually did that. So with the chicks, when she did her first hatch in January, February, sometime in there, um, that she was keeping. I posted on a number of the local groups and said, Hey, you know, later this spring when people are really wanting chicks, cause most people don't want to start chicks and have them in a brooder in their house for like months because it gets disgusting um, and stinky. Mm -hmm. But in Minnesota, most people are wanting chicks about now or maybe even a little bit earlier than now. Yeah. And so I put it up and said, Hey, she's going to be hatching you know, March, April sometime. Um, let me know if you would be interested in, in these breeds and how many you would want. And then we will kind of plan accordingly. Yeah. So yeah. And I think, great. I think that 
you know, the other thing that I encouraged her was to sell hatching eggs. When you think about all the costs that are associated yeah. with all of the, you know, hatching chicks, as well as uh, even I also encouraged her to look into selling ready to lay hens, right? And, you know, when it came down to it, I don't hatching think there's really money in ha- ready, ready to lay hens is difficult um, because you have them for, you know, several months before you get rid of them. And they're usually not at a time when people really want them necessarily. And then you have to figure out what to do with all the, the roosters. Right. Yeah. So I think hatching eggs was something I really wanted her to get into, but that is a lot more customer service involved. Well, and you have to deal with shipping because it's not necessarily just going to be And the shipping costs were very, so I think, I think selling baby chicks locally is just, I think it's, it's a the sweet spot. best way to go. Yeah. Cause I mean, you can sell them at, you know, day, day old or just every year, your time availability to get them sold is really, um, you can sell them as soon as they've hatched basically. And you don't have to put any food, water, or anything into them mm-hmm. barely. Um, I mean, they're the ones that we had hatched earlier this week, you know, so they will have had, a couple of days worth of a little bit of feed in them, but they don't eat that much yeah. the first few days. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, all NPIP and everything that aside, we, we don't really have any plans and I'm not really sure exactly what all the rules are for that anyway. But, um, you know, this is like, for us, it's an operation that our daughter is basically handling that she yeah. gets to be in charge of. And if it weren't that we did all the sales on Facebook, I think we could probably just turn it all over to her. Yeah. Right. We don't really want her on social media and she doesn't really want She it doesn't to really be. have a desire to be on social media. But I gotta fine. say, man, Facebook is a fantastic place to sell stuff. <laughs> it is. It is because it, it looks at what people are looking at, what they're searching for, and then it puts stuff in front of them. So, I mean, I can't tell you with the mattresses, how many times we've had people say, Oh, I was just going to look, I was looking at this one brand new. And then I saw you had it for sale for, you know, and it was practically brand new. And I'm like, yep. The beauty of Facebook. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, so that, that is an operation that we do. I don't really talk about as much because it's just our daughter, but you know, and it's also, we're really going through the very first time where we're, you know, intentional about selling baby chicks. Yeah. And, you know, it like with all things farming, it, it took a year or more to get to this, to this state. Yeah. So, um, but it's going good. But it is going really well. Yeah. And actually, a long time ago, I watched a video by on the Homesteady channel where he was talking about. That's what it's called. Yeah. His name's, um, uh, his, his name is Austin, I think. And he was talking about how to pay for your own eggs. And he didn't talk about selling eggs and, and from the money you make on your eggs to purchase your own eggs. He talked about selling baby chicks as the way to do that. hundred percent. So yeah. Spiruni farm. What kind of engineer are you? Please tell me everything because I have the exact same feeling. I love being an engineer. Um, and it's going to be hard for me to leave that as well. I'm a software engineer. But I have found some outlets, dailygrower.com. I built that whole site myself. And so I still got to do my engineering stuff, but in a much farmier, uh, farmier way. And I'm here to prove to you right now that if you want to start a business and have your wife run it, you can do that. Because <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> She runs the sheep operation. Okay, but she runs the mattress operation. Yeah, that's she runs the true. homeschooling operation. I run it all. <laughs> really, except, she runs except, all of it, except for his day job. That's true. I don't want any. I don't want to touch that. She leaves me alone. Man. Not even a little. Yeah. So, all right. Well, in three seven uh, three in seven seconds, we will have Friend gone two hours. Developer. Something we promised oh. that we would not do. Front end web developer. You need one of those? Spruni makes Tundra and Tacoma and Sequoia. Oh, man. Tacoma's, that's my favorite. 
Ooh. That's my favorite, man. That's what I have my wife working on mattresses for, to buy me a Tacoma. <laughs> that's what I hear. <laughs> I could have bought one. You could have. Because I was like, we're getting a pickup truck. But the one we needed was but what we, we got. bought the one that we needed, yeah. which is an F-150, and we love it. And it's but it's pretty much my truck. It's pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so, so that goes with so, the territory. So you might have to get your own. I started a business, <laughs> and I made her take care, take it over. And well, now and as a result, she she took over anything. all of the you know things required to. I saw the potential, and I was happy to do it. <laughs> So we sold two Jeeps and a minivan, bought the pickup truck. It holds all six of us. Yeah. And it just, it rides smoother than all of those and gets, and gets better gas mileage than two of those three vehicles. So, uh, yes, all Toyotas are expensive. We have a Corolla that we love as well. Oh, Farmer Brad is a farm. I was looking at the wrong thing. Welding engineer. So I, I realized this week when I was turkey hunting that I love Tacomas. I love the way they look. But I don't need a pickup truck for everything. No. So that Forerunner would be super nice for hunting and fishing. Oh, I'm sure. Because <laughs> I think they're really cool yeah. looking. And I don't know. Our pickup, we have the six and a half foot bed uh, um, quad or crew cab F-150. And it is big. Yeah. It is hard. So much space in there. To get it in places that I was used to getting my Jeep. So I think maybe the Forerunner is probably for me. So maybe you're going to have to sell Maddie the Corolla. And buy a Forerunner. Yeah. But see, that's the thing. Like the the engineer <laughs> efficient financial part of me thinks that Corolla gets like 38 miles a gallon. <laughs> well, it would still be it's around. double what the, what the pickup truck You could does. swipe it from her once in a while yeah. if you needed to go a ways. And one is the gas well, mileage. Yeah. Spruny, <laughs> I think you need to go into management. I think that's the only that's the only option here. Is that you know, you gotta get you gotta get on that management. Yeah. I, your management material, in my opinion. Maybe you need to be a manager. <laughs> well, unfortunately in the software field, they don't give out company cards. <laughs> so maybe you're in the wrong business. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> That is a nice thing about the farming business. Your company car is usually a pickup truck. So. Ooh, Volkswagen Golf. Uh, Those are cute. I oh, like what, them. Is that what you want? What's your dream car? My dream? Besides the Volkswagen Bug that's red with black spots. You know, well, that was when I was 16. <laughs> I don't know that when that's I was 16, my dream anymore. A pickup truck if was I were still gonna, my dream If I were going to get a car just for fun, <laughs> I would probably pick some sort of convertible. However, to I drive around in the summer. You know, one thing that she needs in that car is a massive <laughs> cup holder. <laughs> hold on, hold on, one more time, one more time. She just got this from Amazon today, and I'm just <laughs> digging it. She's at. Can you see the water level? She's at three. She's at like four p.m., which is halfway between feeling awesome and don't give up. And where we are right now, it's nine p.m. You should be at you did it. But I didn't even get it. I didn't have it at 7 a.m. when I was supposed to start. I well, on even most mornings, then. you're going to be two hours behind when you just wake up. <laughs> it's not about the time. The encouragement <laughs> is all I need all day long, and I'm going to drink it up. I really it's want. going to be great. I really want that to be a fixture in all future Daily Girl Live broadcasts. Me with my water yeah, bottle, so we can, like, like watch, Justin Rhodes trying to find Gideon's boots. Down. I found his boots. <laughs> I found his boots several times. You won the won the prize. Justin actually put a bounty on finding his apron. Oh, that was in my yeah. That was in yeah, my yeah, video. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that was in one of his vlogs, but he couldn't find his apron, and uh, and Arun ended up finding it. So yeah, we might need some uh, magnets on our. On our car, or on our truck for our farm, advertising the farm, or some, or maybe advertising the mattress, <laughs> the mattress business. I, Here, here's the best part about the mattress business is that we were so kind of still in disbelief that this was a thing that we we're like, well, we got to name it something almost as unbelievable. And I'm just a goofy guy, so I was like, how about 
Randy and Karen's <laughs> Good Time Mattress Emporium. That's the name, official <laughs> name of our mattress business. Yeah. Is Randy and Karen's Good Time Mattress Emporium. So yeah. Uh, people, we give out business cards, and I think people also who are still getting used to the idea, they see that business card, and that's also they um, chuckle a little a, bit. A little bit like, okay, I'm starting to get how how this whole thing works out. Yeah. Well, we're we actually have just realized that we, I think, are desperately need some sort of signage out in front of our farm so people can find it. Yep. Yeah. That's part of the part I'm learning right now is investing in your business. Yeah. In order to grow your business. So uh, that's why I bought a nice camera. That's why we're using the, we're using the nice camera. miles to work every day. How many miles when you were going into the office did you get do date to go there and back? 46 miles one way. So 92 miles. Yeah. Gosh. But I didn't do it every day. Thank goodness. No. So he has a 53 and a half mile one way. That's a trip. long ways. That's a lot. You got to really like your car. Well, I mean, if you're getting 42 miles per gallon, what's yeah. not to like about that? Hopefully well, you got some podcasts or a radio station yeah. you like. It's kind of chill in there. Oh, by the way, a Justin scooter can go a hundred miles on a tank. Justin Rhodes is starting a podcast, so you'll one one oh seven one way. Oh wow! Oh, we're sorry. <laughs> God made me whole. I really want to know more about this mattress dealing. Uh, send me an email. Uh, the name of the company is called ShareTown. ShareTown dot com. Yeah, and uh, let me know uh, if you want to look into it. We'll set up a phone call. We can tell you all the particulars about it if you want. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we have, we have, uh, it isn't an MLM where you're like trying to like build a team, but they do have a way for us to refer people. Like you wouldn't be under us or anything like that. No, you're an um, independent representative. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Not and, tied to us. But in any case, we, we do have a way to do that. So. And I don't know. We can help you. They open up certain regions of the U.S., so it would be best if you were had access to a metro region, so you'd be able to sell to a higher population of people that sleep. Well, that's not necessarily true, though, because if that if if a metro region, if they're already if they already have a pretty um, good network of reps in in whatever their closest metro area is. And I mean, like for us in Minnesota, we're outside of the cities just a little bit, but we're close enough that we can network within Minneapolis, St. Paul. But what we've found is that there's nobody in St. Cloud, which is a fairly big area. Um, and, but, and is close enough to us that we're kind of starting to figure out how to get into that area. So that's not, you're, you're right that they do. That's where they start is in the, the metro areas. But yeah. Brad, but if you're outside of that, Brad, it's you not, got that backwards. If you buy a mattress, we'll give you two sheep. <laughs> not buy two sheep. We'll give you a mattress. However, <laughs> if you, because we win on both ends there. <laughs> and if you take a sheep home with your mattress, you won't ever get to use the mattress. So you probably need two mattresses. Or something. I don't know. So here's another thing that <laughs> I didn't I didn't think of until just now is that when you start getting a side hustle, you might find that there's ways to bring them together for your oh, own yeah, mutual yeah. benefit. Yes. We sell our we don't have meat sheep or hair sheep. We have wool wool sheep that mm -hmm. well they're dual purpose. We yeah. eat we eat them. They're good for meat, but they're not specifically meat sheep like a Hampshire or Suffolk or whatever. Yeah. However, with that wool. We have sold yarn and yarn, we can sell it. It's, you know, over $20 a skein, which means there's a very specific set of people that are going to spend that much money. But again, like I said, with mattresses, everybody sleeps and people are a lot more likely to want nice warm bedding than they are to be knitters. So we yeah. actually took our wool last year, all of it, all of it, all of it and made wool mattress topper and uh, comforter, comforter and pillows, and pillows for ourselves. 
because we we had a mill do it. Right? Yeah, because if we were going to have if we were going to look at selling it, we should use it ourselves and be able to say, you know, whether we like it or not. If yeah. we if we tried it out ourselves <laughs> and it was we were like this is horrible, then there it so, wouldn't be worthwhile trying so to sell it. So we're experimenting guinea pigging ourselves yeah. to see if this is something that's worthwhile and I could see that as a operation that, you know, comes out of two other operations, sheep and selling mattresses. When someone's here to sell a mattress, yeah. they're going to buy a really high-end mattress. They may also be interested in this 100% grass-fed, all-natural, you know, all the different modifiers out there, sustainably raised wool bedding, wool bedding from your local farm. Yep. That so that that is that is eat coming. That kind of stuff up. I that love is it. coming later this year. So half of our, or more than half of our wool, uh, from that we had shorn off the sheep in February, will be processed into batting to become pillows. And that, so I, I foresee there's, we've heard about people that have sheep that shear their sheep and throw it away. The wool goes on the compost pile. And that's like, hey, here is what some farmers consider a waste product. We could pay them for it yeah. and sell it to people that want to be warm all winter, which happens to be every single person in the state we live in. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think I think we have the markets right here. It's just kind yeah. of the logistics of how much can we sell, how much we can only get so much from our our own flock, right? Yeah. We have enough wool to make how many pillows? I don't even know the answer to that question. Less right than 20, right? Uh, how many well, How many duvet covers? No. Less than 10, probably. Okay, we last used, year... We used our, all last of our year wool we last used year all of our wool, wool, but we had we had a mattress topper and a comforter made for ourselves. Queen and, size. Yeah, queen size. And those, I mean, we probably could have gotten... Um, I don't know, probably eight or, or so pillows out of each of the eight or 10 maybe. So, I mean, this year I would say. We're a family of six and everybody got a pillow. Pillow wise, I would say we'll probably be in the range of maybe, I don't know, 30, maybe we'll get enough batting to make 30 pillows. We're currently in our basement. This is my office. It used to be the walk-in closet to our bedroom, which is behind that door. And it is freezing cold in our house all winter long, just stratified air, bad insulation, everything. We put that mattress topper on and that duvet cover on, and it was like this sheep sleep sandwich that made us sweat like crazy. It was so warm. Well, and that was with I the was flannel sheets. When I put the when I put the when I put the regular sheets back on, it was much more comfortable. Uh, I still had to change what I wore to bed because yeah. I, you know how when you have everyone. a fever and you wake, you have the flu, you wake up and you're just like sweating. It was like, oh my gosh, what's happening? And it's like, this is so much warmer than any bedding that we ever had before, and it's all. Did I mention hypoallergenic? Yeah. It's, you know, all natural. And as far as temperature goes, all of the you're adjectives. not really the right one to sell it, though, because you have thyroid issues and your body temperature control is not regulated. 30 million people have hyperthyroid hy in America. That's one in 10 people. That's true. One in 11. Yeah. I mean, we're also only making pillows for sale. That's true. So, but anyway. I mean, come on. We have a mattress on the property. I love it. I love it. I love like, it. Do you want to know where they came from? It's right over there eating, you know, that grass. <laughs> so uh, we've looked at doing socks and stuff like that, haven't we? Um, we have talked to people who, who send their stuff out and have it made into socks. And I would say... Um, one thing from you gotta what find I've people seen, that want to buy fifty dollars socks. Yeah. Okay. So they're expensive socks. They're very nice. But 
what I have seen, you don't get your own wool back. So you send your wool to like this co-op thing and then you get socks back and, but it's not necessarily your wool. It's it. I mean, your wool was mixed in there. So, but who knows if you got any of your own wool back. Whereas what we've been doing, like, I definitely want my own wool back. I don't want somebody else's wool. Yeah. I put the time, I put the energy into raising it, those animals, a certain, Breeding them a certain way. A like I want, I want my product back. I don't want somebody else's. So, um, so yeah, so we haven't gotten into that cause I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen a business that is small batch wool socks. Yeah. Like that it's like running out of a wool co-op sort of a deal to do the wool sock thing. Yeah. So you need a lot of wool to do that kind of thing. Uh, you can't sell single socks. You yeah. Gotta sell them in pairs. Yeah. Uh, but I, th- I think that's something that I'd really like to, to look into more and we can use some of our contacts with like sustainable farming association to look for farms that have wool that they don't really use or that they're yeah. willing to sell as a sheep breeder, as a sheep farmer. I mean, I mean, if you don't have any interest in all the legwork it takes to once that wool is off of your sheep to actually get them or get that, get that wool shipped and ordered and deal with the mill and get it shipped back and all that product. If someone could just take it from you, that's like the equivalent of selling hatching eggs, right? Yeah. It's like, you don't have to deal with, with all the hatching and the waters and the feeders and the heat lamps and the brooders and all that stuff. Right. So, I mean, I, I would think that would be a good proposition to other other yeah. sheep farmers well, that aren't really met, interested in the wool. We've met farm, uh, we've met and know of uh, a number of farmers that um, either compost their wool, so they're basically th- throwing so it they, away, or um, they sell it to their shear at like Pennies. ten cents a pound. Which, um, I mean, just for a gauge, we get like about five to six pounds raw off of each of our sheep. So that's like 50 cents. And taking 50 cents worth of wool and selling it, selling it as how much would the pillow end product cost? The end product? Yeah. Like what are we going to sell a pillow for? Um, I think there'll be around 30 30 to 40 dollars and how much to ship it and process it less than that i i don't know the i'm trying to i I know to think here that we're talking about a product that we could sell for 30 or 40 dollars that would probably only five to ten dollars in if we can buy the raw material for that cheap um i would say they're they might be more like 10 to 15 okay in, in double pro- your money in processing yeah double your money yeah which i think people will buy it yeah i don't think we'll have a problem selling it. no i mean really nice pillows uh you know can go 40 to 50 dollars easy yeah. so it seems like we need to hit that price point well maybe i don't know i haven't i haven't totally priced it out is what i'm trying to We're say still like thinking I, about it. I i i i don't i feel hesitant to give all the numbers because um i i haven't they're free range them. pillows, people here. Grass fed <laughs> pillows. Once I send that wool Local out, I have I easily pillows. have like six to nine months before I'm getting it back and have to sell it. So I've got time to do my do you think, to figure out my pricing. Do you really think pillows would be better money, better profits, and easier to sell than like duvets? Well, here's Brad's the, gonna drop ship it for us. Here's what I would say. Um, if we were to send our wool out for duvets, we're, it's going to be kind of like our lambing, our lamb situation where like, we're going to have like, we're going to be able to get like one or maybe two back right now with the number of sheep we have. And so, yeah, we won't have any trouble selling them and I don't know that the, 
I think the profit is actually better on pillows, to be honest. We'll figure it out. And we'll have more pillows to sell versus duvets. So All in all, it's not really, in my opinion, it's probably not worth our time. Unless we can get a lot more wool than just what we produce. Right. We'd have to, yeah. We'd so have it's to not like just a problem it. of processing it and selling yeah. it. We also need to come up with a lot more raw material. Right. And we're not going to buy it from China or Australia or anything like no. that. The, the idea is that it's, you know, American made and local and local. Locally made from, well, I guess if we were to like drop ship it on Brad's, I, I wouldn't have any problem buying something like that, that was from small farms. Yeah. Whether it was local or not, doesn't really. The challenging thing to get into doing that for us would be the amount. Like yeah. we don't have the quantity to, to make it like a, Hey, we sell duvets. It's like, we sold a duvet. <laughs> we sold two. Oh, you want one? Well, next year, um, you can get on our long list where we will then again have two available. Yeah. Like it's just, that's the hard part with selling yeah. lambs is yeah. that we, Pillows people we could are actually always get wanting them, but we don't really have a lot to sell. Them, yeah. So. That's because we keep saving more for ourselves because they're delicious. Yeah. All right. So if you know someone that has sheep and has wool, they don't know what to do with, we'll be looking soon. I think we'll see. <laughs> She's not going to commit to it. I, she, I, she, I got us into mattresses. I'll get us into this too. And she'll love it. It'll be great. <laughs> Maybe. All right. We've been going for two hours and 21 minutes. We yeah. always say we're not going to do this, but thank you but for people, everyone. People love to talk. Yeah. Yeah. And we love chatting too. Yeah. But it's almost 10 o'clock where we are. Yeah. It's, it's Baruni. It's almost 11 where, where they are. Yeah. So. It's the Friday <laughs> night is wrapping up. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. We really appreciate you. We hope to see you again next Friday. Uh, actually, we have a wedding next Friday night, don't we? We do. Maybe we'll do a Thursday. Does Thursday work for everyone? We'll see. Anyway, you know what time is this time of year. It's crazy this time of year. Yeah. Oh, you're in Arkansas? I oh. Just... Oh, I was thinking no, of no. Alabama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's... Still, it's early. It's still 10 o'clock. You're good. Yeah, the night is young. Yeah. I mean, she stays up to all hours of the night. So I am. I'm a night um, Yeah. But anyway, thanks for hanging with us. We love doing this. It's so yeah. fun to meet new people and just share what we learned and then also bounce ideas off each other. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. So we're going to sign off now. We are. Appreciate you. Thank you for joining the channel. Thank you to everyone who's new that saw me hanging out with Justin and, uh, and uh, and I got a couple of new videos coming out soon. I got my turkey hunting video with Jack's very first turkey. I know not everyone's interested in hunting videos, but they're fun. And then um, a video that I made last week when the weather was nice, planting some potatoes and talking about soil health and why I don't clean up my garden in the fall. There you go. So, all right. Goodbye, everyone. Good, Good night. Good to see ya. Later on.